welcome everyone. Welcome to our, for our, I guess our first new iteration of the Tri-Campus uh, Transportation Summit here at NYU. Um, it's 7 a.m. in New York, 7 p.m. in Shanghai, and I think 3 p.m. in Abu Dhabi. So we found a time zone that made it work for everyone and just want to be mindful of the time given that I know some folks have things lined up right after this and we don't want to keep our Shanghai friends up too late. So I'll just give little prompts throughout the day of the, uh, the time so that we can stick to the agenda as close as possible. So with that being said, uh, Khan, I'll invite you to deliver some opening remarks here on what we're going to talk about. So I, mean, I don't want to make this like a super serious, like, uh, you know, president's speech or anything like that. Um, but really, I mean, thank you very much for um, agreeing to be part of this, uh, especially and Monica took the lead and, and helped us a lot, and Zibin on, on Shanghai. Um, and this is really great. Um, so I had this idea, partly you can blame on COVID because I was kind of at home and I said, like, what can we do, you know, to, to, to have a little bit more communication? And I just like said, okay, maybe we can um, start some kind, something new. I mean, actually, uh, this is one of the blessings of COVID, I guess, because now we are more comfortable with Zoom and, and distant uh, uh, communication. So that's, uh, I mean, the first trial, uh, probably it's not going to be perfect, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we can, you know, continue to, uh, like as a tradition, and probably we can do some of these things uh, mm -hmm. in person. So maybe next mm -hmm. time we'll be in Abu Dhabi, and then we'll be in mm -hmm. Shanghai, and in New York. Uh, so that'll be really great. So uh, I just have one slide for, for opening. So I would like to really use this and, and future similar in events to uh, build an integrated ecosystem of innovation and expertise, um, kind of in, in tune with NYU's vision to be a true, truly global university. So, I mean, you know, with COVID, uh, this kind of slowed down a little bit, but also it kind of reminded us we are really global. Whatever happens in Shanghai affects us, whatever happens in the Middle East affects Shanghai and so on. So I think uh, this is a really great opportunity to um, uh, think about that. And the second one is like, how can we, uh, so I want this to be a discussion. So I'm not gonna talk too much, but I want to hear everyone, like how can we make this uh, a way to exchange ideas and determine um, ways with which we can, we can uh, communicate more closely, collaborate more actively. Uh, we already have active collaboration, uh, but can we do more? Uh, and can we really uh, uh, be more integrated? I mean, as, as you see, time difference is an issue, but not that much. I can wake up a few days uh, a week, like real early and uh, do things. So, and then, um, um, and then obviously the final thing as researchers, can we leverage this campus collaboration to be more responsive to global transportation questions that are becoming uh, uh, more and more um, uh, uh, obvious. Um, I mean, in New York now, I'm hearing that there's a shortage of uh, baby food uh, uh, because because of the logistics system, the breakdown in logistics. So, luckily, my my kids are grown up, so um, I, I don't suffer from that. But there's a lot of people who who worry about that. So, so uh, can we think about more globally? Uh, especially within the context of smart cities. So I, I kind of emphasize that I'm a transportation person, so smart cities is kind of a late thing that recently we're thinking about, but I think we should do that. So I force myself, whenever I say transportation problem, I also say smart cities because transportation is the um, uh, kind of a backbone of the cities and everything that transportation does affects the cities. So, so I'm trying to be uh, uh, in that sense, to change myself, and I think uh, with the initiatives, especially in Abu Dhabi, that's one more clear. So, so we want to hear more about like uh, these different initiatives, uh, and then have discussions. And again, uh, stop. We can stop each other, ask questions. This is not like a super, uh, um, you know, a serious conference. Uh, this is about changing ideas and 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 finding out ways to collaborate. So, uh, with that, again, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, uh, and, and this is uh, really great, and I hope that we can continue uh, this uh, uh, type of collaboration uh, in the near future and make this a, a, maybe a, a, some kind of a tradition. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, 
yeah uh, thanks Khan. Shiri, yeah Shiri will just take over and yeah so actually we wanted to um professor Magid Iskander who's the head of uh, the civil department here at Tandon, and everyone hopefully knows him uh was originally scheduled to be here and welcome us he came down with COVID, so he this is the only um we promise kind of non-interactive programming of the day but he really wanted to to share uh, a couple words with the group and um, recorded a little video for us. I'm just gonna play that, it's, it's less than two minutes. So right. there we go, hopefully everyone can hear this. Dear colleagues, uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to join your uh, transportation research summit today because I'm battling COVID. Uh, nevertheless, I am very happy that this event is taking place and I hope to be able to uh, attend future events uh, and I'm sure some future events will be organized. Uh, the transportation program at MIU ex has existed for a long time. In fact, uh, we are the second oldest transportation program in the United States, and we are also the longest continuously operating program in the United States since the oldest one is at Yale is no longer there. So with our joint efforts, in all three campuses in, in New York, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai. We really have one of the largest transportation groups in the world. And I highly encourage you uh, to work together uh, to achieve great things. Uh, I think uh, Helen Keller once said, uh, alone we cannot accomplish very much, but together we can accomplish a lot or paraphrase them. I'm sure I'm not saying it properly. Uh, I'm sure that uh, together we can have a very strong uh, presence in the transportation arena. Uh, we bring different skills uh, to this. Uh, there are people who are more applied, there are people who are more theoretical, there are people who have strengths in one area versus another. And I think cumulatively, we are extremely uh, strong as a transportation faculty. So I'm very pleased that this event is taking place. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but I'm sorry, it's, uh, <coughs> you might have heard that COVID is sometimes rough. Uh, so wish me well and take care. Bye. So that was Professor Iskander for, on behalf of the Civil Department here at NYU. Say one thing I, I want to say, um, I did not introduce or ask everybody to introduce themselves because this is a rather large group. Uh, but when each campus start talking, maybe they want to give like a brief introduction of who is on the phone, uh, as, at least on the faculty side. But I just wanted to kind of skip the uh, that part just to make sure that we don't waste too much time. Uh, but but we can do that while we 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 move on, basically. All right. Okay. Great. All right. So I'll we'll hand it over to to Samer from NYU Abu Dhabi just to deliver some opening remarks. Sure, thank you, Shri. Um, so, uh, I'm Samar Madanat. I know, uh, I think, almost everybody in the Zoom, uh, Dean of Engineering here, and um, uh, Professor of Transportation Engineering in Civil and Urban Engineering. Um, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with what Maggit said about uh, the benefits of uh, closer collaboration between all of us. Um, it's rather unique and actually the only place I know where you have uh, campuses in two different continents and uh, uh, at least three very different regional parts, uh, each of which has cities with different types of problems uh, in the context of transportation. And so there's a lot of, uh, of interesting collaboration that we can build on. Some of them we've started already, some of them we haven't, and this is a good place to, uh, to explore such collaborations. Let me very briefly just introduce the people from NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, we have, in addition to myself, Monica Menendez, uh, Professor of uh, Civil and Urban Engineering here, also the Director of the Cities uh, Research Center, and she's going to say something about that later. Uh, and I have Saif Jabari, who is also an associate professor of uh, civil and urban engineering, also a transportation person. Somebody is supposed to join us at some point, uh, the fourth member of our transportation community here, Ali Diabat, uh, 
also a professor of civil and urban engineering, uh, focusing mostly on logistics. If uh, I expect he will join us uh, after the meeting start. Uh, so to keep it short, and uh, I'll pass it back to you, Shri. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, next, we will hand it over to Keith Ross from NYU Shanghai. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'll keep this very brief. I, I first of all would like to uh, thank the organizers. I uh, thank uh, Khan and Sri and the other organizers for putting together this uh, very nice uh, workshop conference. Uh, I think it is a great idea. Uh, I, I expect it to be a, 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 a success. I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot from each other and perhaps uh, see opportunities for new collaborations. And assuming it is a, a big success, so hopefully we'll be able to do, make this a, a yearly event uh, and, and repeat this again next year. Um, I like to. Um, I, I was in Shanghai up until a few days ago. As you all probably know, Shanghai is in an unusual state right now. I, I um, so I was in lockdown for six weeks and um, flew to Paris on Saturday, uh, and now I'm in Paris. Um, you know, one sort of interesting. You know, of course, there's very little traffic, ongoing traffic right now in Shanghai. Um, but uh, you know some interesting new developments there is, which is more le less related to transportation, but perhaps related to smart cities. Is um, you know I think what Shanghai is planning to do in the very near future is install these kind of mini PCR uh, testing booths all over the city. So there'll be thousands or tens of thousands of these booths all over the city, and. Um, that the you know the plan is that everyone is expected to get uh, a PCR test uh, every 48 hours. So uh, you'll be able to just go up to the booth and probably with no longer you know, not waiting more than five minutes, show your QR code and then they'll uh, put a swab down your throat and um, and you're on your way. And then you know probably six to 12 hours later uh, on your iPhone, the, the results of your QR to code will, will show up and you'll get a green code that will permit you to enter malls and um, subway systems and so forth. So yeah, this is kind of interesting new kind of smart city um, uh, thing that's happening there. Of course, that may have you know certain privacy ramifications, of course, but it's just, uh, just you know, something that's you know, a little bit different. So anyway, without further ado, uh, I'll just also introduce the uh, NYU Shanghai participants. Um, we have uh, 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 Jervin Chen, he's an assistant professor of transportation engineering. Uh, has a very strong interest in the transportation systems of the future, electronic and autonomous transportation systems. And uh, we have also here uh, Chung Hu Guan, who is an assistant professor of urban planning and um, has been very active in, in a lot of interdisciplinary research for us at, at NYU Shanghai. And again, once again, I'd just like to thank you all for setting up this very nice workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kid. Um, Shiri, one quick thing. Professor Nassif is in the audience. Can we get him as part of the panel? Uh, so that if he wants to say some things, uh, it will be easier for him. Sure. All right. Thank you, Kid. Uh, so um, again, thank you again for everyone. So uh, are we going to move to the? Yep. So our next session, uh, or I guess our first session, or how we organize it. Again, trying to keep it informal, but uh, just for the sake of uh, understanding our programming, we wanted to have um, about twenty minutes per campus now to talk about. Um, research and education, uh, highlights of the research and education centers and programs at each campus. So um, I believe we have a couple presentations now and our first one um, is going to be from Monica at uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. So Monica, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Let me know if you can see the screen. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. So you see the slides? Yes. Yes. OK, perfect. Uh, so, well, I, when I initially said good morning, but then I realized that for Shanghai, it's probably good evening. And for those of you who are in Abu Dhabi, good afternoon. Um, I want to start by thanking Ken and the City Smart team for putting this together. I 
think it's a great initiative and hopefully it will lead to more connections between the three campuses. We now have a critical mass in transportation. Like we have a lot of people in transportation, especially even more so with the latest hires in New York. Uh, I think they're in the call. So welcome to NYU and hopefully we'll see you at NYU AD soon. Now on the topic of NYU AD, um, in this slide, which is the one for the, for the summit, um, even though this is an amazing and very beautiful picture of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, I have decided to change that to a pic of, wait, to a pic of Abu Dhabi. Uh, that doesn't focus, on, first it's Abu Dhabi, and second it doesn't focus so much on cars, but in a thriving city and a city that is actually aiming to become more sustainable. So it's not only about being smart, but it's also about being more sustainable uh, in the future. And actually, I didn't realize, but this is a perfect segue to, to the presentation when I'm going to be introducing uh, the city center at New York University Abu Dhabi. So cities, in this case, stands for Center for Interacting Urban Networks. This center was established in September 2019 uh, in the first batch of new centers of new research centers at NYUAD beyond those that were established when the university was created, right? What exactly is cities or, or better yet, um, why do we care about cities in the first place, right? Well, I always said cities have existed for a long time. As soon as civilization started, people start sort of moving closer together because, you know, well, we like interactions with other human beings, but also to capitalize on the economies of scale that, uh, that are brought up by living in proximity to other people, right? Now, with time, cities have evolved, and this Abu Dhabi is a very clear example where the time span for that is very short. Um, the infrastructure has improved dramatically. The city has grown tremendously. But the essence of cities across the world and throughout time sort of remains the same. We enjoy the interactions with other people. We want to take advantage of the economies of scale uh, provided by cities. And cities provide access to resources and services that we couldn't find, that we wouldn't be able to find otherwise, right? So then the question is, what's next for cities? And I think most cities, or we probably would agree that most cities around the world are trying to become more connected, meaning with the different components of the city uh, talking to each other more intelligent so that uh, with such connectivity between components, we make more intelligent decisions and more resilient so that these decisions are not myopic, but they also make sense in the long term, right? Leading to a more sustainable city and more resilient uh, city. And that explains in part why there's so much buzz, not only about cities, but about smart cities. You know, the conversation actually started already about smart cities and what is part of a smart cities. And uh, when we think about smart cities, we need to think about many aspects of it. And transportation, as um, Ken said, is certainly the backbone and a very, very important part of it, but not the only one. So, what we do within the center cities, uh, the way we approach this topic is by looking at the problem, at the whole problem in terms of networks. You know, we assume or believe that most of the challenges um, or the changes uh, that happen in cities are associated to some type of network. And um, networks typically fall within one of three categories, uh, at least within the context of cities. These are digital, physical and social, right? So let's start with physical networks. These are, we're very familiar with physical networks in transportation. They're a key to our survival. Uh, think about the road infrastructure or the electric grid. Uh, they're changing with the emergence of new technologies that have been around for a long time, but they're changing. And our research addresses current and future physical infrastructure needs in urban areas with an emphasis on long-term sustainability. What about digital networks? We are witnessing within our lifetime what is what many people are calling the digital transformation of society, especially with all the growing with a growing amount of data and, and all the advances in this data acquisition, the processing of the data, the storage of the data, etc. But what are the risks and opportunities associated with 
search transformation or with what people call digital societies. So what we're doing in digital networks in, in cities is uh, leveraging and developing digital technologies geared towards the efficient operation of urban systems, including the instrumentation of large areas to enable data-driven insights. And last but not least, we have social networks. And we have seen this expanding really fast as new technologies are connecting people all over the world. But I'm not talking necessarily about social networks in the context of Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we deal with social networks in cities, we deal with social in, in cities, the center. We're talking about social, the actual networks that we have with other people, be it personally or through the digital apps. And we, it's very clear that this digital, these digital apps are in fact reshaping the way we interact with other humans and then the resulting social networks. So our research studies the mechanisms by which social networks influence change and applies its understanding to induce changes in individual behavior that would ultimately lead to collective improvements in the quality of life for urban systems. Now, what is really important within our center is that we are not focusing on these three types of networks or as silos, but more on the interactions uh, between them. Does I'm sorry, our research clusters, we have four research clusters, and they fall at the intersection between two or more of these networks. Because we believe that the interactions between these networks are not only affecting the different aspects within cities, but also the connections between cities themselves. So that's the last, um, the, the fourth research cluster here, which we call intra intercity nexus. Now, how do we do this? This seems like a huge amount of work. Um, well, first, we have sponsored new collaborations across the three campuses. Uh, so some of you in the call I know have been involved uh, on cities, even if you're not in Abu Dhabi. But we also foster and really, 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 really encourage collaboration across disciplines. So in fact, uh, in cities, we have faculty from the four divisions at NYU Abu Dhabi, that is engineering, social science, sciences, and arts and humanities. And I know most people in this call, it's probably within, falls within the engineering uh, category, but I want to highlight the importance of adopting sort of a more holistic approach to cities problems, even within transportation, uh, which is something that we certainly cover extensively in cities. Um, collaborations with people from other disciplines, economists, social sciences, people from complex networks, people from urban planning, et cetera, could open the door to many new developments in our field, right? So I think as part of these conversations, we should also be thinking and how to include people from other disciplines that have a clear interest in transportation as well. Now, uh, we're actually making sure that all our projects are connected. So this shows, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but the first batch of projects that we had in cities, uh, group according to the four clusters I mentioned before. I'm sorry. And, sorry, my phone is my... And I'm not gonna go over the details, but what it's what I wanted to say is that they're all interconnected somehow, either through data or through tools or something else. But we're trying to interconnect to connect every everything and everyone along the same lines. We're connecting or trying to bring the different stakeholders together. That's the academia, the public sector, and the government. So to that end, we're not only doing uh, research activities that could be of interest to the public sector and the private sector. But we're also implementing or um, doing a lot of educational and outreach, search, um, outreach initiatives, sorry. And with that, I'm gonna close the presentation of cities, but certainly I'm happy to answer any questions that might be about cities. If you're interested in participating in the center or be connected to the center and you don't have a chance today, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm happy to tell you more about it. Um, Thank you, and I think the next person is Summer. Um, yes, if you stop sharing, I can share my screen. Yes, I stop. Uh, all right. Okay, um, so, all right, uh, people can see my screen. All right, good. Um, let me put this into presentation mode. Can you still see it? Um, half of it, meaning not full screen. Oh, you we're seeing see your slides as presenter, not the no. not the. Oh, that's all right. The There's no harm. That's okay. There are only two slides anyway, so let me do that. 
Um, so as I said, uh, uh, for this part, I'm just going to take a few minutes to give a very brief overview of kind of the ecosystem of labs, uh, focus uh, or transportation related labs we have at NYUAD and each of them is associated with one of us. Uh, so SAFE uh, Jaberi's lab uh, named Traffic Flow Dynamics and Computations. Um, this is very much uh, for those of, uh, of you who know SAFE, this is, uh, his uh, research spans in these domains. And as an example of, of how large that span is, uh, his postdocs uh, come from completely different backgrounds, one in Statistic is a statistical physicist. One is an expert in particle physics, and the third in control science. He also has currently three PhD students, not all of them in transportation engineering. Um, Monica, uh, Monica's lab is named the Mobility Lab. Uh, she has five postdocs currently. Um, and they span also the range of uh, tools and, and uh, interests that she has. So while uh, Monica's research is primarily in traffic, uh, it expands beyond uh, urban traffic to um, urban mobility in a broader sense. So she also has an expert in OR, one in data science, one in control, and one in uh, G uh, GIS, uh, GIS, sorry. She also has one PhD student currently. Uh, Ali's next, I saw Ali joined us. Um, so uh, Ali uh, has a nifty name for his lab, it's called Palm, um, like, the fruit, like the tree. It's, um, his research focuses on production and logistics management and supply chain issues. Uh, he currently has three postdocs, all of them working in logistics and a PhD student. And finally, uh, my own lab, uh, my research interests focus on transportation infrastructure. Um, and because my research has expanded recently to go beyond simply looking at infrastructure management, or um, both in the sense of uh, social, cost minimization and environmental uh, cost uh, mitigation, uh, but also now has expanded to protection of transportation infrastructure from uh, inundation due to sea level rise. I have among my postdoc and research scientist team, I have one as an expert in uh, coastal hydrodynamics, so is a PhD in fluid mechanics, essentially. I have a computer scientist, uh, and two traffic engineers, one of whom has uh, just stepped down recently and I'll be looking for somebody else. I also have a PhD student. And that is it for my presentation. Um, who do I, um, I think, Thanks, thanks Samir. Three. Yep, yeah, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Monica and Samir for uh, introing us to the groups at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, next, we will move to Shanghai and uh, Zibin, you're up. Hey, uh, can you use? All good, Zibin, go ahead. Green? Just... Okay, thank you. So uh, this is Zibin Chen from Shanghai. And on behalf of our Shanghai team, I would like to bring a brief uh, introduction of smart city related initiatives at NYU Shanghai. So um, first I would like to focus the uh, research topics actually uh, we are currently uh, studying. So first part is about the empirical analysis of electric vehicles. So NYU Shanghai um, has a close relationship with the Shanghai EV data center, which is um, a, an, a private NGO, okay. Um, and collecting the data of all the electric vehicles sold and registered in Shanghai since 2015. And the data set consists of 44 items of static information and 80 real time, uh, 80 items of real time information. So, given uh, such a big, um, um, actually, uh, a big data set, actually, we are currently doing some research regarding the data mining to explore the 
charging driving pattern of different types of also different types of users. And, and furthermore, we are currently conducting I think we lost. I think we lost him. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh, oh he's back. Okay. Sorry. I think we lost you for just um, a minute. So. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. The internet, the uh, internet connection may not be that good. And then, um, contrary, um, we we also uh, plan to develop a test bed based on the, the that data set uh, to develop a simulation. Okay. For. Uh, for the modeling of the charging and driving behaviors of electric vehicle drivers. And also uh, we would like to base on that to develop some simulation based optimization for the possible uh, infrastructure deployment and also the policy design. And secondary the, um, the, the, um, is about the modeling of emerging vehicle technologies, which may include uh, uh, mobile charging infrastructure and also the Chart platooning the, the, the itinerary, the plan of chart platooning by considering uh, the both uh, the cooperation and also the competition of different uh, chart free. And, and also, we um, study a little bit regarding the modular vehicles and how we can apply these emerging vehicle technologies to the right sourcing and transit services to improve their performance. And also um, currently one of my PhD students is investigating um, the application of artificial intelligence in transportation systems. In general, the, uh, when we deal with some optimization, for example, the system, the infrastructure system design problem, we normally build up an optimization model and Given that some of the parameters might be uncertain, okay, so normally we apply some machine learning technologies to predict the, the, uh, those parameters. And then given that we apply the optimization model to optimize the system design. But currently there is a new chance or a new approach to integrate the, the prediction and the optimization together when we do the prediction. And also the last part I would like to highlight is about the uh, visitor behavior and utilization efficiency of urban green spaces. Um, so in this type of this research, um, uh, we, we um, try to combine the big data with the few surveys or thick data. And then we turn to the education. So currently the, in Shanghai, we totally have six uh, students uh, in the smart city related field. So from four from my research group and the other two from Chen He's group. And we are open in the four uh, courses at NYU Shanghai for uh, undergraduate students. And also we develop uh, uh, the new energy vehicles, the data training base uh, uh, between NYU Shanghai and the Shanghai EV data center. And each semester that we conduct uh, several field trips uh, for our undergraduate students to the local uh, tech companies or research institutes. And uh, we have multiple research centers in NYU Shanghai. Particularly, um, I would like to highlight the Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, the center provides great support uh, for the organization of our first academic workshop in mobility and smart cities uh, in last year. And then um, actually we are currently the, um, uh, setting up a research center for computational and operational research in transportation together with uh, Tongji University, Southeast University, Zhejiang University and uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. We would like to make full use of our resources to target some uh, national or even uh, and further international the grants. And recently, the, we have successfully the established uh, our first the Shanghai Key Laboratory the, at NYU Shanghai, um, Shanghai Urban Lab. And later on, our colleague, uh, Professor Chen He Guan, as the co founder of this lab, is going to bring a brief introduction of the lab. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Zubin, and we'll move over to uh, your uh, Shanghai. Chen He. Shanghai. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. I'll continue to uh, do the introduction for the lab. Uh, you guys see? Mm -hmm. Coming. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I mean, I appreciate uh, for uh, Tribune to uh, introduce our lab already. And then second of all, I also very appreciate uh, Professor Keith Ross for you know, inviting me. Uh, so, I mean, even though uh, I'm a urban planner, but a lot of my research is actually related to transportation and smart cities. Uh, especially, you know, we call this uh, digital smart cities for the people. So this is kind of a policy very much related to the context of uh, the current Chinese conditions. Um, so with further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, NYU Shanghai Urban Lab. So we established this lab uh, a few years ago and actually yesterday, as of yesterday, I, had ne I never had a chance to report this good news to uh, Keith Ross. Uh, so this is actually our first Shanghai uh, Key Laboratory uh, that is established at NYU Shanghai. I think we tried before and then we never get this kind of key lab position. So the meaning of a key labor laboratory uh, for the Shanghai Science and Technology Community is that we will get continuous support, you know, both uh, in terms of uh, uh, research funding uh, and also in terms of policies that to help us to establish this uh, lab and then we also through this lab we, you know we open up a channel that we can uh, have our research uh, collaborations uh, with more local institutions and also fund a channel to apply the, uh, per the outcome of our research uh, to the real policy implications uh, so this is the photo and uh so in terms of uh, research directions uh, there are three attached to uh, this research lab. So the first one, uh, I think Tribune has mentioned this uh, uh, already, is about visitor behavior and util utilization efficiency of urban space. Um, but we actually extend into a new otherwise the Wi Fi is not very good, <laughs> as Tribune mentioned. So the first uh, project related to the utilization of social environment, uh, sensing data combined with field survey uh, seek data. So we expanded this into beyond uh, urban green space. It is more focusing on urban ecology. And the reason why we do this is very much related to the policy, uh, current uh, policies in China. Uh, as you know, uh, the urbanization policy has shifted from uh, focus on urban growth, rapid urban growth to sustainable environment and uh, focus on the quality of life. Uh, so there's actually a lot of energies uh, has been put on the growth of uh, the uh, planning of uh, urban green space, especially using this digital uh, technology to support uh, getting the social and environmental uh, data. So some of the collaborators uh, we have, uh, of course, beyond the NYU uh, community, uh, these are the collabor collaborators we have. And we have some research grant also through international collaboration as well as uh, local uh, also local channels and uh, so some public media exposure and then we are making a MOOC project uh, for this study and these are some of the recent publications uh, actually some of these publications are related to faculty members uh, from NYU Shanghai, you know, uh, actually uh, there are two PhD students from NYU, uh, of NYU uh, New York, NYU New York are actually involving uh, in this project right now. The second is uh, planning policy uh, informed the pandemic city and sustainable build form in the digital era. The reason we choose this is also, you know, uh, very much follow where the research direction is heading, where the research grant is. Um, the first research grant we get is uh, 900,000 uh, Chinese yuan. And this is from a city investment group. So if you actually want to work on, if researchers want to work on uh, urbanization, 
uh, related policies. So um, they said you have to work with the CD investment group. So those are the central uh, SOEs uh, for those of you who don't know SOE is state owned enterprise. And then the second uh, grant we get is 2.4 million. Uh, we get this uh, actually January this year is from a nonprofit organization in China is also supporting the pandemic and post pandemic studies. These are some of the publications, research directions uh, we are working on. I'm just squeeze this really quick. And then the third one is uh, geospatial modeling of urban growth. So this is actually the uh, majority of our, of our publications and most of our students are working on uh, this project. So we use urban growth modeling, we use AI technologies, we use social environmental sensing to support uh, these uh, modeling of uh, the future uh, urban growth. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Chen And that, that wraps up NYU Shanghai. So thank you to both groups, Abu Dhabi and Shanghai, uh, for your presentations and, and uh, being um, very mindful of time. We're doing great on schedule. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Professor Osbe again for um, first uh, on the New York side, um, updating the group on RC2 Smart Center. So, so should you drive this, the slides? Yeah, um, I'm here. Yeah. Um, again, uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here. Um, so from our team, uh, I think everybody is here uh, except Maggot, so uh, Professor Joe Chow uh, um, and um, Professor Semia Ergon, um, Hani Nassif from Rutgers, Professor Gandahari, uh, and we have two of our new faculty members, uh, uh, Daniel Vignon and David uh, uh, um, uh, Eugene Winitsky. Uh, so we are full team here. So I'm, I'm really happy that we are all here. Uh, I actually had a chance to talk to Hani yesterday and convinced him to wake up this early and to join us. So uh, in, a, in a minute, um, I'll also let him say a few things. Um, so. So C2 Smart is a new center, uh, five year old, but the transportation research at NYU Poly, which used to be Brooklyn Poly, uh, is not new. Uh, and actually when I uh, first came to uh, NYU, I came uh, not only to the civil engineering department, but to Center for Urban Science and Progress, COSP, uh, as a joint appointment. Uh, and it was exciting to me because uh, for the exact reason that 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 you guys, Samer and Monica and uh, uh, Zibin and, uh, uh, and and everybody else mentioned, uh, because we uh, there was an opportunity to go beyond um, uh, beyond transportation uh, and what I've been doing it for all these years and to think in a in a bigger uh, framework, basically smart cities. Uh, and and I mean Masood can talk more about that. Uh, but then I did a little bit of research, and when I came to CUSP, actually, Mansud was already was part of the CUSP. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't even a new idea, because when I looked at um, George Bugliarello, which was the president of uh, NYU Poly, uh, I, so I'm just going to be just saying the dates, 1973 uh, onwards for 20-some years. Um, uh, you know, his, his really vision for NYU Poly, Brooklyn Poly at that time, uh, is to have a, a, a urban university dealing with uh, city problems, urban problems. So I, you know, just this is just to set up the, the overall idea. So these ideas were not new, uh, but CUSP was an exciting uh, new development. And when I came to NYU, then I started thinking how we can even make a bigger uh, impact. Uh, so we, um, uh, you know, and this is coming up this year again, we, uh, uh, and most of you, you are familiar with the University Transportation uh, Center's program. So we wrote uh, a proposal uh, focusing on smart cities and transportation. Uh, and as part of that, uh, it was things that, that, are, uh, that were very um, important uh, going back to five, six years ago, basically big data uh, and uh, AI and so on. So we have a focused tier one. This is like a, a small scale a UTC. Uh, and then we were successful because I think there was an interest in, in this idea that we are discussing right now and which is maturing uh, throughout three campuses um, uh, at NYU. So uh, I'm very glad to see this great effort at NYU Abu Dhabi and why Shanghai is doing great. So this was actually uh, part of that thinking, I would say, without talking to each other. 
so um, just a brief history of uh, US uh, DOT Center. Uh, we received uh, $9 million federal funding. Uh, there's a requirement for 50% match. Uh, and it's a consortium of universities, uh, which also makes uh, kind of makes me think about if we can do it with uh, this set of universities, uh, we can have a different level of collaboration with other NYU campuses. So our, our partners in this uh, consortium is University of Washington, Seattle, University of Texas, El Paso, City College, and Rutgers. Um, and, and one thing I always say that uh, these are not selected as um, uh, for the sake of selecting these partners. Uh, every uh, PI, uh, or we call it associate directors at each university, they've been my long-term colleagues. So I have, uh, or Joe's, you know, Joe and I, uh, we kind of look like who we can work with. And, 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 and so we build a team uh, that had experience in working together uh, uh, in a, in a um, kind of concerted manner. Um, Beyond that, we were able also to uh, build a network of local uh, agencies. So we now have uh, a, a large, uh, we call it on-call research agreement with New York State DOT, uh, around $12 million uh, for um, four years, um, I mean, through the lifetime of the center. And this is actually based on our experience with uh, New Jersey DOT and, and, and Hani is here uh, with the New, New, uh, New Jersey um, um, uh, agencies because we basically uh, had a similar, um, when I was at Rutgers, um, setup and we kind of were able to build the same kind of uh, setup, like an almost in-house research arm uh, to the state DOT. Uh, of course, we, uh, the other universities in our consortium, they're doing similar things but not as direct a part of C2Smart, but as their, their overall efforts, but this is uh, direct a part of C2Smart. Uh, and then due to really, I mean, very um, in hard work of Hani uh, and, and Rutgers team, uh, we also built um, a great collaboration with New York City uh, and, and we, we received major funding from them. And actually one of our signature projects that I'm gonna talk about uh, is something that Hani and I we are co-leading on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway as a test bed. But that also brought uh, additional funding in addition to uh, several NCHRP projects uh, and NSF projects that we've been receiving as part, as part of C2Smart. So to make the uh, 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 long story short, uh, we are uh, building um, a, a, a research entity with uh, sustainable funding uh, uh, made of a number of uh, universities and researchers. Uh, and now we have eight full-time research and administrative staff at uh, C2Smart NYU to kind of facilitate this whole work. And, and uh, some of them are here, Shiri and Molly, uh, and I really want to thank them uh, for their very uh, hard work. Next slide, sure. Uh, so I'm going to go now faster. Um, so this is... Uh, Again, a summary of, of what I said, there, there are a lot of opportunities. We actually uh, uh, funded a number of, a large number of projects, 40 peer reviewed projects. This is, I think, important for us uh, because we're not really in the business of creating one big project and, uh, and just work on that. We want to have a peer reviewed process uh, for a large number of projects every year and then build on, on, on our uh, record, basically. We have published around 250 uh, uh, papers and 200 conference part presentations, uh, a lot of joint proposals and so on. Uh, but one of the things about the center is the real world impact. Uh, of course, we want to contribute to academia, but we also would like to work with our partners like city and state partners uh, and you see here some of the uh, like most active partners in addition to New York City DOT, New York State DOT. Uh, we work with the Port Authority, New Jersey DOT, New Jersey Turnpike Authority, NYSERDA, and so on. So, uh, so we see our mission is to, is to build uh, a, a framework, a, a kind of a network of uh, um, agencies and then uh, help them solve their uh, problems and thus have real world impact. Uh, we also increased our student support uh, tremendously. Uh, uh, so now we, are, we have around 36 PhD students funded by the center tra in transportation. Uh, so that's 
uh, kind of we are proud of that because this is becoming a major uh, program and of some of them are uh, NYU Shanghai students, some of them are NYU Abu Dhabi students, but the majority of them are in, in New York and, uh, and from New York, uh, New York City. Uh, we are also working very hard in increasing the enrollment in our uh, master's program. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that we are proud of, we provided seed funding for uh, student innovation and uh, uh, entrepreneurship uh, so that they, they can take their research and really uh, make a product. And this is one of the signatures uh, of NYU uh, as a whole. NYU wants to promote entrepreneurship and we would like to see that happening on the transportation side. On the right side, you see our uh, team uh, and everybody probably knows all of these uh, great uh, uh, professors. Uh, and, and also we have uh, a, a large number of uh, NYU PIs uh, and, and so on. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Kind of, I could just say five seconds. I just want to acknowledge also uh, Professor John Falcocchio is here with us, who's celebrating his 50th year at Poly and NYU 10. And so congratulations, John. Definitely. John and Elena, they were here when I came. Uh, and also uh, 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 Roger Ross was here. Uh, so, uh, uh, and as I said, it, transportation was not new to NYU. Uh, uh, there's a long tradition of transportation. And we are really happy that John Falcocchio and Elena Process, they're, they're here working with us and, and contributing. And I just now see John is online. Uh, so sleepless in New York. Uh, so he's like listening to us. Uh, thank you very much for joining John. Um, so next slide, please. So, I mean, these are some things that like, as a summary that we are trying to do, uh, we are we're trying to be adaptable. So our center is, is very flexible. Uh, we've shown that uh, with some of the projects that we created during COVID-19 uh, and some of them are really making a uh, great impact. Uh, for example, this uh, using the New York City DOT cameras uh, to uh, identify uh, people and objects on the streets uh, and then using AI and machine learning techniques. Uh, this was just created uh, as a student driven project and then now becoming something uh, a large scale that the city and the state is interested. Uh, and that brings us to the real world impact. Uh, and and uh, in addition to these kind of projects, we have very large and, and community uh, projects like Brooklyn Queens Expressway uh, uh, and, and, and test press that we are working on. Uh, for the last several years, uh, even this is before the DOT is really uh, uh, was was um, into equity and diversity. Uh, we were really working on this kind of projects, and one of the projects that I really like to mention is uh, the CV connected vehicle uh, project we did, we did with low vision uh, people, um, and that was really a, a really very kind of a challenging project, but it was uh, 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 very fulfilling, and and, and results will be published very soon. Obviously, we have projects like Equitable Commute Project, uh, Pink Tax on Transportation. So there's a lot, a number of projects that we've been doing on equity and access for disadvantaged populations. And we continue to increase the number of these projects. On the education side, I mentioned some of the uh, successes, but we also have, we're lucky to have a lot of undergraduate programs native to uh, NYU. So we are taking advantage of them. Uh, we are bringing undergraduate students and we are bringing uh, high school students uh, in summer to work with us on some of the transportation projects. And the uh, New York City uh, uh, traffic camera project where we scrap video from traffic cameras and then do image processing actually was partially done with two undergraduate students uh, working with us as interns. And then they stayed on and now they're going to, to masters in great uh, schools. Uh, so that was really a, a good example of how we can leverage uh, our own students uh, from the city or from the university to work on urban, urban problems. Uh, as usual, we do a lot of professional development uh, efforts with New York City DOT, New York State DOT. Uh, we also have, we're proud that we have many, many interdisciplinary projects. Uh, uh, too many to, to count, uh, but we work with uh, NYU Stern, uh, Wagner, uh, School of Medicine, School of Law, uh, Marin Institute, and uh, among others. Uh, again, that's really, I mean, in, in New York level, uh, and how can we scale it up to 
uh, to a global level, I think this is one of the reasons we are here. So next slide, please. Uh, so very quickly about uh, this, this BQ project, because we'll talk more about it. Uh, this was a, 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 this is a very important infrastructure in New York, and I'll again talk more about it, but what we have done, basically we are instrumenting that small stretch of BQ, so-called cantilever, uh, triple cantilever, uh, with help with New York City DOT, uh, and New York State DOT is obviously interested, uh, and actually our work created uh, uh, kind of a, so much interest and, and uh, um, innovation that uh, now there's a new law that the, the state passed uh, to basically be able to enforce overweight uh, uh, truck um, uh, you know fees basically uh, uh, like a, uh, uh, speed tickets uh, uh, it's not been done yet but uh, but the bill has passed so so this is I think one of the very few cases where uh, uh, the the city will be able to write uh, tickets for overweight trucks to kind of discourage them from using the infrastructure uh, that's in uh, not in, in great shape so not to damage the infrastructure. The other project, again, that we're very uh, proud of is the Flood Sands project, where we funded several of our faculty members, uh, Andrea Silverman and her team, uh, and then they, they developed this, and, and, and few faculty uh, and, and researchers at CUSP, they built these sensors uh, that are low cost and ubiquitous to kind of um, uh, 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 detect floods in New York City, which actually uh, had a huge impact on uh, several people's lives. Uh, so, uh, so now they, uh, I'm told, they uh, were able to raise seven million dollars from the city to deploy these sensors uh, throughout the city. So we really provided the seed funding the, uh, uh, to, for them to develop the, the intellectual part of it, uh, build the uh, sensors, and the next step they work with the city and they're going to deploy this at a large scale and probably save lives and our research will have uh, a, a very positive impact. Next slide. Uh, so CV project, I'm already late, uh, Shiri is warning me. Uh, this was a large project, $20 million and we were part of it. We just finished that. Uh, you see some of our papers that we wrote on that, mainly on the safety side because the, the project was about safety. Uh, and this was again a project that was very, very uh, important to understand how connected vehicles uh, uh, impact city traffic. Uh, it was, um, you know, uh, led by New York City DOT, uh, but as a university partner, we worked on very closely. And if you look at the uh, right bottom side, uh, we also led the part of the project for uh, visually disabled uh, uh, pedestrians. Uh, and how to test uh, certain kind of uh, applications to make uh, their trip uh, in the city more uh, safer and, and efficient. So I'm gonna move uh, quickly on that. Uh, so this is, uh, again, I talked about this equity. We have a number of projects on equity, uh, but we also have uh, uh, started like, um, you know, uh, talking about our, our uh, faculty and students and graduates uh, from the underrepresented groups. And actually, I was surprised to find out we have a lot of faculty in other universities who graduated from, from NYU uh, Poly in the past, now in, in leadership positions. Uh, and then we try to kind of uh, uh, rebuild the network, bring them back, uh, and then so that uh, they can also be role models for our current students uh, and, and postdocs and so on. Uh, let's move on, Shuri. So uh, this is the slide that I want to spend one minute, you know, uh, this is why we are here. So uh, everybody has great programs. Uh, I talked about ours. Uh, we heard about NYU Abu Dhabi, NYU Shanghai. But how can we uh, basically uh, uh, build a network that's more active and more collaborative? Uh, um, so that's the, the main question. Uh, we all are doing great as uh, uh, individual campuses, but I think if we come together, uh, we can really have a great, greater impact uh, in terms of research and education and, and legacy. Uh, and one uh, thing that I'm uh, really interested in is this, this bullet that I'm just pointing out. Uh, how can we build multiple urban test beds? Uh, and it can be different from different for different cities 
that that we can uh, um, kind of collaborate. Uh, and with this virtual virtualization of the world, I think it might be easy to share uh, uh, lessons learned, data, uh, and even do joint research using these urban test beds, like the BQE one that I mentioned. So we're building uh, kind of a web uh, presence for that. And maybe we can uh, talk about that. Like and every campus might have their own uh, uh, focus area, but how can we make it accessible to all the researchers and students in all campuses and they can freely use the data, uh, the facilities uh, to, to kind of do even more interesting stuff. Uh, and then uh, this was actually a question I was listening to Monica. Uh, I mean, you know, we are working with uh, researchers, not only from engineering. So, uh, so like, how do we build this bridge between disciplines uh, uh, more um, actively? Uh, so NYU Abu Dhabi has great experience with that. And maybe we can uh, do more and, and bring different disciplines even in greater numbers and, and, and kind of lead this effort, uh, not only in the US, but in the world of, of bringing uh, people from business school, policy, uh, not only engineering and, and hard sciences, so-called, and, and how, what, how can we do that? It's not always difficult. Our engineering students are not always very comfortable with that, but there is uh, lessons learned and we can really uh, talk about that. Um, Shirid, am I done? Okay, good. Yeah, that's it, Khan. Thank you. Um, so uh, we, we have some discussion time later as well, but um, just to keep us moving on track, why don't we move on to Masood, Professor Gandahari, who's going to talk about our NYU's uh, Urban Systems Program. Sure. Thanks. Um, thanks, Sri. <coughs> Made about, uh, about five minutes of, uh, of uh, presentations for you, and I'll see if I... <coughs> Can reduce this, all uh, right. You see everything? Yep, go ahead. All right, perfect. Okay, I wanna get rid of my banner. Sorry about that. Get that out of the way. All right. Um, so so the, the, the five minutes that I, that I mentioned, and uh, thank you for the invitation, um, it's um, basically going to give you the snapshot of the history of the program philosophy and what we may, we may call as a platform, which you may appreciate a little bit about the curriculum, the first cohort, and, and what are the next steps. Um, so just about the history, in, um, I would say 2008, maybe it really started 2006, around the time of the merger of, of, of Polytechnic Institute and, and NYU, there was um, a, um, a soul searching um, activity at the Polytechnic Institute with respect to the dire directions to follow. And, and I recall, and, and Keith may, may, may recall this also, that there were three uh, areas that were chosen. Uh, those included telecommunication, health, and urban systems. And um, it looks like we kind of delivered on that because at the time of the merger, I think that message was uh, heard loud and clear uh, by uh, New York's uh, NYU um, Washington Square campus. And in a way that led to the 2012 uh, launch of the Center for Urban Science and Progress. At the beginning, there was not that many of us. Uh, it was uh, a startup and <laughs> it, it did certainly start and it, it, it did well for a long time. And, and in, in a way it still, it still is. Um, uh, and then it took some time uh, with help from, uh, um, incidentally, I should uh, also mention that at that, that time, the, the urban systems program, at the beginning, there were three champions of those. That was uh, Ilan Duran, uh, George Bulierlo, and, uh, and John Falcocchio, who I believe is, is present uh, in, in the audience. Um, in 2000, uh, I would say uh, 16 or so, we started thinking about the PhD program. At that time, uh, Professor Giran and, and, and uh, Konstantin Kontokosta put, uh, started putting things together. Uh, in 2018, basically it was uh, submitted. And in about 2019, um, I continued that in 2020, the program was approved by New York State. And that was around uh, November of 2020. And the first cohort started in 2021, which I'll introduce to you shortly. As far as the philosophy, uh, I guess one way of putting it uh, is that we uh, seek to, to, to have a program and to have an education program uh, for students that has disciplinary rigor uh, with an interdisciplinary perspective. And, and you, you kind of probably can tell this by, the, by the, the mix up of the cohort that you will 
see later. And, and the objective is, is essentially to have a doctoral level program that, that addresses sort of complex multifaceted urban, urban topics. And hence the reason for involving um, students and faculty from, uh, from the various schools, College of Art and Sciences is not included here. And this is uh, the schools within NYU that, uh, that you see here. Uh, as far as what perhaps we call, we, we can call it as the platform. And the reason for the platform, what I call it, why I call it the platform is precisely what I heard from a number of you with respect to using the city as the test bed or using the city as a, as, as a lab. And GNU in a way is, is kind of ideal for this work. Um, as a matter of fact, we, we, we have, students currently actually funded by Shanghai and then I would be working uh, um, as uh, students within within uh, the program and uh, we um, are very active uh, I would say the students are really they really appreciate the the uh, um, you know sort of the the, the, the topology of, of our campuses as a matter of fact the six of the 12 uh, students within the current cohort will be going with me to, uh, to Germany this uh, summer uh, uh, for, for a few days, about a week, um, interacting with some of the German students uh, and, it's, it's, and they're really excited uh, for this opportunity. Um, as far as the curriculum, uh, the curriculum um, uh, is 12 uh, credits of core. Uh, the three mi middle courses are the standard courses. Um, um, the, 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 the second one from the left is essentially on data acquisition, uh, processing and interpretation. Middle one is really on computing machine learning and, and the second one from the right is more on planning and management. Um, the far left is really a um, sort of research methods course, you would call it, you know, best practices. How do you kind of wrap your head around sort of interdisciplinary science of cities? And the one on the far right is really what you, 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 the students are, are to step outside of the academia and work with an entity. Oftentimes, at least uh, for the time being, the plan is for this to happen at the end. Uh, but there are some cases that front loading this has been suggested by students and we've certainly um, been able to entertain that. Um, and then this, uh, after the core courses, 12 electives, uh, and that is followed by uh, the 21 credits of dissertation. Um, and finally, um, I should then uh, introduce you uh, the current cohort. Uh, of 12 students. Uh, these are the students who started in, uh, in September of uh, 2021. Um, Callie, she's um, from UC Berkeley. She's sort of a system, study systems engineering at, at her master, master's level. Vivaldi is a geographer from Penn State. Uh, Tulan is really a data scientist from Johns Hopkins. Francisco is public policy slash management, uh, business management from, from Columbia. Dana is really a sort of a artist, a media type person. Terry is an attorney, actually works for New York City uh, Department of, um, of, of, of Construction. Um, and Deidre is really, she's an architect um, uh, from uh, Parsons Yichuan, who's currently uh, going to be working at uh, YU Shanghai, uh, really management of technology. He's also very interested in data science. Fale and Abdul Rahman, they are both, uh, actually they're funded by the Saudi government here. Uh, one is a computer scientist and the other is electrical engineer. Zaire is a mechanical engineer from NYU, and finally Ryan Pointer is from public policy, Wagner Public Policy. As a matter of fact, Ryan is, I would say, is, is our best student. He's uh, not only just on quote unquote the soft uh, topics, but really on the computing analysis interpretation is, is, is an exceptional student. Uh, finally, on the last slide, in terms of what are the next steps? Well, the 2022-2023 cohort, we're kind of, uh, um, kind of squeezing uh, the, 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 the door, closing, <laughs> making the door a bit smaller because at this rate, it may be just too many people to deal with. I think this year is, we're going to accept approximately nine. Um, uh, so last, last year we accepted 13, 12 of them joined one, had some issues with finances, but that was out of 60 students. This year is out of 39 students, we're accepting nine. Uh, the second thing is that's in the, uh, in, the, in the forecast is course calibration uh, based on feedback from students. Uh, I'll be looking in to see what uh, types of uh, adjustments to the course curricula we should be making in terms of syllabi and so on and so forth. And finally, in the governance, uh, we will be sort of, uh, we haven't had really much chance to build um, sort of an advisory board, which uh, really we did promise. Uh, we have a, a, an in-house advisory board, which we've appreciated their, their collaboration and their guidance. But really now we need to step outside and, 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 and get this thing uh, uh, at a broader level. Uh, so, so that um, pretty, pretty much um, wraps, up, uh, wraps up my piece of it. 
um, I actually have to um, have have to. Um, first of all, I should say that you know I, that I that I really value uh, you know my participation in this community. Um, I'm actually overseas at at a at a session that I came out, but since I, I'm really interested in in in, in this activity and, and being involved, um, I, I really wanted to, to make sure to join. But I have to apologize if you don't you see me disappear. It's not for lack of interest. It's just that I was in a session and I just came out to make uh, this communication with you. So thank you for for having me. Um, uh, Masood, um, I know time is uh, limited, sure. No, no, no problem. But, but while you are here, let's if, if there's any like one or two questions. Uh, from uh, and it will be a, like a breather for for the rest of, of uh, everybody else for you for this very interesting program uh, before you you leave let's get a few questions and I sure. can I mean throw one question uh, mm -hmm. or a comment I think the the diversity of the student body uh, is a testimony to the diversity of the advisors and involvement from other schools that that we will get I think that in that sense. Uh, it's it's you should be really proud of this student cohort and, and I know the the new new students coming in so uh, you want to comment on that I mean like the diversity in terms yeah of no it's system. yeah yeah I think you you really um, kind of uh, highlighted uh, a, a significant feature um, you know um, and that first single credit course that I mentioned the research methods uh, um, the, course that I mentioned, uh, there was a lot of discussions and these students have really managed to understand each other, benefit from each other, be nurtured by each other. They actually, you know, spend a lot of time outside of the class together. They really value um, sort of the environment that they're in. So yes, I, I, it really has, it has, there has been challenges in terms of really just like really rigorous coursework that, that they've been subject to. But you know, that's, that's uh, the name of the game, and they're going to be taking their qualifying exam in May, May, as a matter of fact, May 23rd, when I, when I return on the 20th and 23rd is the written portion, and on the 31st is going to be the, the, um, the, the, the oral portion. So yeah, so it, it, really, it really is, I mean, this is an experiment for, for, for us, for, for me, and certainly for us to see how these students turn out, and, and yes, indeed, uh, Bringing in faculty, having regular events, I, I certainly would be totally for that. I think this is in everyone's interest. Any questions from the audience? Anybody, uh, especially from other campuses or from other? All right. I think All right. That we're going to we're gonna zoom right along. Um, so the, our last presentation from NYU New York, from Tandon, is just on a new initiative we launched uh, this past year at, um, at Seed Smart called the Student Learning Hub. So the Student Learning Hub um, was something that uh, was conceived of by our team um, to provide, uh, let's call it auxiliary or supplementary skills training for um, our students um, outside of the classroom. Um, real world skills was kind of the focus. And it's also served as a, a vehicle for um, our graduating or, or, or graduate students, I should say, to, to get uh, direct teaching uh, experience and 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 working with other students and passing on their skills and learning down the line. I want to acknowledge who's not here today, or I believe she was on and and may have left. Uh, Dr. Jenny Gao, who's one of our, our postdocs and uh, senior research associates, who was also a PhD graduate from the program. She's uh, she graduated in 2020, but going to the NYU commencement today, so she was going to present this, but we gave her a break today. Um, so just really quickly on the Student Learning Hub. So we have, we we kind of. Bucketing the, the things that we've taught in the Student Learning Hub into, into three, three buckets here. So one is sort of very in-depth topics that, you know, go beyond, um, that basically translate project and research work into sort of short class format, you know, whatever you can teach to students in a one-hour format. We do, um, do these applied learning courses. So these are, um, uh, you know, learning about a specific technology or a specific um, um, uh, software or program. And then finally, we also include courses on skill building, um, for example, how to do data visualizations or introductions to new topics. And these, these programs have proven to be really popular and, and a great experience for our students. I'll also just say that um, from, the, from the C2 Smart side, our USDOT uh, program managers that are responsible for um, overseeing our center have uh, remarked about how this is such an innovative program and, and, and have really caught their attention and something that we want to share uh, beyond um, just at C2Smart. So 
um, among other things that, and I'm going to hand over to Molly right now just to just to just to uh, give us some more information on it. But among other things is we are looking for ways to expand this both to um, students at the other campuses, but even beyond that. So Molly, why don't you jump in here? Oh, hi, everybody. Um, so I will be very quick. Um, I won't sort of read through all of the stats and things, but um, as Shree mentioned, it has been a very successful program. Um, and one of the things that we really were looking to do is kind of expand the access um, beyond just uh, not just beyond our consortium, but also beyond NYU. So we have been working with um, various colleges kind of from the city colleges of, New of, um, of CUNY um, and basically allowing their students to have the same level of access as our students. Um, so something that's been very important to us is really making sure that we are kind of spreading our resources where we can um, and also giving those opportunities um, you know, outside of NYU and, and we talk about how New York is, you know, kind of the city as a lab and um, that means that everyone in it is kind of, you know, the, the scientists with us. So um, that's been something that we've been, we've been really proud of and that we've seen growing. Um, we have seen, you know, students taking these courses from, you know, different countries, different schools kind of all over. So, um, you know, hopefully this is something we can also expand, you know, within NYU's own network of, of diverse campuses. Yeah, so year, year two of this program starting in the fall, um, we're kind of putting together our, our schedule now. So especially for folks from the, the other campuses, um, if you want to send your students to participate, but also if you have, um, you know, graduate students or, 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 or postdocs or anyone that uh, would you think would really be able to share something valuable for for our community, please just let us know and we'd love to love to include you and make you a part of this. I mean, before uh, we, we move on, I think the, the key feature of this program is it's taught, the course are taught by PhD students or master's students uh, with a, a very rich knowledge of what they do, basically uh, most up to date. So really, I mean, it, it serves two purposes, create content courses for other students to take, but also uh, take um, advantage of uh, this deep knowledge of these PhD students, postdocs, and master's students in a certain topic, capture that and let them uh, really learn how to teach. So we work with them, uh, we review the content, but then it, it kind of, they also become proud of what they've done because uh, it's, it's an opportunity for them to, to teach in one hour or two hours those skills that they uh, accumulated with in two years, three years, four years of their studies. So uh, in, in that sense, I mean, I think this is, uh, I have to give all the credit to Jenny Gao. It's really her vision uh, and, 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 and the team taking this uh, one step further and making it uh, such a successful program. All right, so uh, let us know, like Khan said, if uh, any, anyone wants to participate in that. If not, we'll keep going with our agenda. So um, we're only slightly behind schedule, so we'll move on to our next session now, which is signature projects across the campuses. So I think this this session was designed to be kind of uh, quick, quick uh, overviews of some really exciting projects that are taking place. So just uh, quick hitters here. And uh, we'll start again with our Abu Dhabi colleagues. I think Saif, you're going to start first, right? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Shri. Sharing my screen. All right, can you, uh, can you see my screen? Yep, go ahead. All right, perfect. Uh, well, thank you for, uh, well, thank you Khan for organizing this. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two, or very, very quickly talk about two tools uh, that fall under uh, the category of analytics for real-time traffic operations. Um, two of the three tools I'm gonna talk about were partly funded by C2Smart. Um, so the running theme is uh, we're talking about traffic operations. So you can think of, uh, intersections or managing, uh, you know, priority at intersections as being, you know, one of the key uh, themes of, of, of all three works I'm going to talk about. Um, and another key theme is dealing with uncertainty. So, for example, incidents, uh, changes in demand, and so forth. Um, and another theme is that we're, we're uh, that these works are focused on finding ways to combine data that you might be getting from sensors in, in, in the, the real world with traffic physics, uh, with the uh, uh, goal of maybe imputing, uh, you know, missing data 
So uh, an, an example is what I have uh, in the picture in the lower uh, right hand side here, um, where you have two different kinds of data. You might have point sensors like these little little uh, you know rectangular boxes, and then you might have data from uh, probe vehicles. So you have trajectory data. Um, the first problem I'm going to talk about is about imputing uh, data that you're getting from tra for vehicle trajectories. So you have, you might have full coverage of the network, but not all the time. So full spatial coverage, but not full temporal coverage. Um, and the focus of the, these three research projects, and a lot of the research projects I work on, is delivering guarantees of performance of some sort, and then also guaranteeing that computation, uh, the computation time is, is feasible for real-time implementation. So we, we work on these uh, analytically, these two, uh, these two aspects. And I'll give you a taste of these. So the first one is, uh, a, the first project is a, is a data uh, imputation project. So here we have vehicle probes. And uh, so we have full coverage of the network spatially, but not temporally. Um, and, the, and the art was to uh, first start with uh, not, well, models of traffic flow, which are nonlinear in nature, if you want to really capture how uh, traffic uh, conditions propagate in space and time, you need nonlinear models. Um, and they're also stochastic. Um, and so to, to be able to do it, to run our, our estimation problems, we, we uh, developed an ensemble process and looked at what happens in the, uh, in the limit of an infinite ensemble. So it's like you're sampling, and if you have an infinite sample size, can you derive a model that you can work with? And, and we get a Gaussian process, and so we use that uh, in a Kalman filter to, uh, to, uh, to do the estimation. Right. So here's an example of a ground truth, uh, ground truth speed fields and density fields, and then something with a 5% probe penetration. So this was using uh, real data from Michigan. The other project looks at uh, imputing or forecasting uh, sensor states uh, in the real world. So this used data that we got from, from Abu Dhabi. Uh, and so each zero and one corresponds to whether the sensor is actuated or not. And so we have historical data and we have present data. We're trying to uh, forecast, say, 10 seconds into the future, what the sensor states are at the network level. Um, and the way we did this was we modeled it as a, uh, a matrix rank minimization problem or a matrix completion problem. Um, and we did some, we did boosting. We included previous days uh, in the problem as the as, as, as what we're boosting the problem with. So we're capturing uh, seasonal uh, trends. Um, and the two uh, real main um, outcomes of the of this work were that we we developed a model that or an algorithm that converges uh, at a sublinear rate, so very very fast for very large problem sizes. And uh, our tailored boosting technique uh, also came with a nice uh, error bound, so we can bind the error uh, arbitrarily, meaning if I add more data. I can achieve any error bound that that you want, and so uh, and so. And this, and this is an example of the uh, training error versus the the true testing error, right? And these are examples of uh, you know the, the the forecast versus the true uh, the true data. I have uh, good examples and bad examples, uh, both uh, ten, looking ten seconds ahead. So that's something that you would use to inform um, you know an immediate signal timing uh, plan uh, type. Uh, signal switch or something like that. 120 seconds is, is looking a little bit farther into the future for, certain, for, for applications that need that. Uh, the last application looks at distributed intersection control. And so you have a network of, of intersections and you're trying to maximize the throughput through, uh, through all of the intersections simultaneously. Um, and the nice thing about, so this uses something called back pressure, which comes from um, wireless communications networks. Um, and the nice thing about, about traffic signals is that the problem decomposes and so you can solve one problem per intersection separately um, and the art is in how you decide on the weights so our contribution to this work was to use uh, you know continuum traffic flow modeling um, and so our we calculated weights that do take into effect that take into account how uh, traffic is distributed along uh, intersection links and we uh, you developed a uh, you know a performance guarantee that says that we can guarantee by working this way that uh, the, uh, the, the that that we can stabilize the network, right? So it has a, a network stability uh, guarantee, and because we we can distribute the problem, it's very simple to solve. 
Okay, so incorporating the physics allows us to capture um, things like uh, when you have an upstream incident, when you have heavy traffic, or if you have a downstream incident, our model is, is aware of these things without having to really tell it that there's an incident, it knows what to do. Um, and so you, you see that in standard back pressure applications, you see this queue building up along uh, this direction when you really don't need it to. Um, same thing, um, same, same thing uh, here when you have different kinds of incidents. Another um, test that we ran was, and this is my last slide, was we wanted to see what, what happens if you have an accident and, there, and, and the growth of congestion is inevitable. Um, once you remove the incident, does the algorithm um, kind of help the, the you know, the, the, the network rebound in a graceful way? And the answer seems to be yes. So we're, we're, these are distributed algorithms, but they collectively work to, to mitigate uh, congestion throughout the network. So that was something nice that we wanted to take away from this. And that was my last slide. Stop sharing and hand it over so to much. Uh, Monica. Yeah, so uh, say thank you so much for that. Um, and we can sort of toss over to Monica. Thank you. And hold on, I get pop ups from Zoom. Um, <laughs> so, well, uh, in Abu Dhabi, we're all speaking. So, this is sort of speed dating for researchers. So, I'm going to try to do my thing in, in five minutes. Uh, I'm gonna, the, the idea is to introduce my lab, mobility lab, or the research that we're doing through the context of a specific sort of project or topic in my case. So um, before I do that, let me briefly, very briefly talk about the things that we're doing in general. On one side, we have information, we're dealing not only with collecting data, but also trying to interpret the data and how do, you know, what can we get out of it? And on the other side, we're looking at technologies and how do we use these technologies to develop flexible multimodal transportation systems that are efficient yet personalized, right? So now for the presentation today, as the title indicated, I'm gonna be focusing on the left side of this uh, slide. I'm gonna be talking, it's, the title of the presentation was uh, Link and Network Level Insights from Large Traffic Datasets. So I'm going to start then by describing the traffic data sets um, and, and before I go into the insights. So this is work that I started when I was at my previous institution at ETA Zurich, but we finished and we published data while I was here. So we basically collected data from over 23,000 loop detectors worldwide, uh, 44 cities, over 44 cities. I'm sorry, over 40 cities. I think it's 46 or something. Uh, and the data came, most of the data came in three to five minute intervals. So basically what we had were flow and occupancy readings for all these loop detectors in three to five minute intervals. And we had to clean the data, standardize it. It all came in different formats. Uh, we geolocated all loop detectors, uh, but Ultimately, what we did was we created what is now the largest multi-city traffic data set that is publicly available. We made it free. So it's available to the whole community. So if you want to access that data set, it's, you can just access the website utd19.ethz.ch. Uh, uh, UTD stands for Urban Traffic Data. 19 was the year where, where we published it. And so now, what do we do with the data? I'm going to give you now some examples of the sort of research we have done. Uh, Evidently, this is just, you know, you can do way more things um, with it. In fact, many people using the data is not even from transportation. Sorry. Um, so with the first, at the link level, uh, uh, we first compare 50 functional models, meaning fundamental diagram models with four noise models components at over 10,000 uh, locations. Now, um, we were trying to find not the best fundamental diagram model, but the model that fits the observed data or the empirical data the best, right? And accounting for the fact that there's noise, we all we're all aware of the uh, full the noise that you have in in observed data at loop detectors. So um, we have developed a tool now where we can analyze data without discarding non-stationary states, which can become very handy because in practice almost nobody. This uh, discards a, the station, the non-stationary states. We can see that the noise distribution. So in this graph, you see the flow. You know, it's a it's a flow density or flow occupancy graph, and you can see the distribution of noise 
as a density changes. And uh, it's clear that the distribution of, of, no of noise changes as a function of occupancy. Uh, hence, the most flexible functional form and noise model component fits the data the best. And in this case, it has been for the fundamental diagram and non-parametric model that nobody knows. Uh, and another observation is that city, country, road topology, and detector location in this data set have no impact whatsoever on model performance, which can become very handy. Now, this comparison is the, more com the most comprehensive comparison that has been done so far across models. Uh, it also looks into noise. That's something that is not typical uh, at all. And um, it's mostly using urban data, which is something very different from what is normally done. Uh, people have typically access to, to, traffic, to freeway data. So now at the network level, one of the first things we did was to use uh, the data to understand how the network fundamental diagram or the, micro, the MFD, microscopic fundamental di diagram works and to develop a smooth functional form for that MFD so we can easily estimate the MFD even if we don't have the data, right? And that sort of functional form has allowed us then to calculate networking efficiencies, both in unimodal and intermodal settings. Why? Because we have what well, will be the optimal, we can estimate the optimal microscopic fundamental diagram, and then we will have to observe in case we do have data, the observed microscopic fundamental diagram, and any difference between those two will be uh, due to inefficiencies in the network. Um, also at the network level, we're trying to understand how traffic and congestion behave at an aggregate level. So we look at traffic and congestion patterns um, for multiple cities across uh, length of one year, and we saw that they were reproducible per se. Uh, so they can be predicted with very limited information. If at the beginning of the day, I know which traffic pattern will I, would this result into, I can pretty much predict what's going to happen on the, during the rest of the day. And as a follow-up to that, we have also seen that congestion propagation behaves very similarly to a percolation process. And this sheds light on many complicated traffic phenomena that we couldn't understand before. And with that, I finish. I'm sorry I went super fast, but um, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Monica. Um, so next, let's pass it over to Ali. Hi, so let me just share my slides with you. Okay, so thanks for uh, organizing this uh, conference. Uh, my five minute presentation today would be about uh, a few of my research papers that I'm currently working on and I have been working on uh, for several years now. So uh, I will go over uh, 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 six topics quickly, but all of them lies within the, the domain of building operation research or optimization models for applied logistics problem. So the first one I would like to talk about is about uh, the fixed partition policy inventory problem. This paper we published in transportation science last year with one of my uh, postdoctorate at NYU Abu Dhabi Walid Naji and external collaborator uh, 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 from, from Italy. So the idea about the fixed partition policy uh, inventory routing is to extend the inventory routing problem by uh, 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 restricting, restricting uh, the, uh, the routing or a group of retailers to be visited at all time by the same drivers. So this is can lead to a, a lot of benefits. Some of the benefits that is coordination uh, type that we, we, we can uh, plan the, uh, the routes in, in a simpler way, but uh, also by reducing or adding restriction to the formulation of the problem, this can reduce the solution space and we can solve the inventory routing problem in, in uh, uh, e e 
com, com, relatively easier to the traditional inventory routing problem. This is the original uh, or the initial expectation, which is we were surprised that even the, the restricted problem were harder to solve than the traditional inventory routing problem. But there are two main uh, benefits for uh, the consistency, adding consistency to inventory routing problem. Uh, 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 the first one, it's the third one, but the first most beneficial for this extension is limiting disruptions. So once we group or divide customers into cluster, if a disruption happened in one of these retailers, we does not need to expand the disruption for the entire network. Only that specific cluster will be affected, affected by the disruption. Uh, uh, the second benefit is, is that consistency comes with some core, some way to make it easier to adding fa familiarities to uh, to the driver or to the uh, 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 to the service provider to deal with their, their customers. This benefit has a lot of application in healthcare and uh, 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 several of papers have been published recently in top journals in operation management that talk is that, that talking about talking about the benefit of consistency, especially in routing uh, routing problems. So uh, we consider two type of uh, 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 consistency or dividing the the the, uh, the customers and the retailers. So fixed cl clusters with fixed routes and uh, fixed clusters but with variant routes. So these two these leads to two different problems. The two problems we solved in using branch and cut. And uh, again, one of these papers has been already published in Transportation Science, and the other one is under the second division, also in the same journal in Transportation uh, Science. Uh, the second problem that uh, I would like to talk about is uh, 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 the integration between location and inventory uh, problems when the demand is stochastic. So integrating location and inventory uh, has been there uh, for more than 20 years now. The first people that publish in integrated location inventory are some colleagues in, currently at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, during their PhD at Northwestern. So they published inventory location problem when, uh, when they integrate the fixed charge location problem with a single echelon inventory problem. Uh, uh, a few years left after that, colleagues from uh, Singapore, Public, uh, worked on extending that to a multi issue inventory with multi issue location inventory. But the entire thing was under deterministic demand. So they are assuming deterministic demand. So adding or considering uncertainty or stochastic demand in, this, in the integrating uh, setting will add a lot of complexity to the problem. So uh, 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 this paper uh, we are we have been working on for a couple of years now. We honestly speaking, we uh, uh, second revision was rejected from OR recently, and now we are uh, working on revising the paper and resubmitting uh, uh, to operation research. So I will just move quickly to the other areas. So the other uh, area that I'm working on is on uh, uh, maritime logistics. So uh, 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 this has three main areas. So either the quick range scheduling problem or the birth allocation problem, problem or pheasant scheduling problem. So in this research, I will just, in this presentation, I just want to quickly mention two of these applications, uh, the quick range scheduling problem, which is uh, I and uh, one of my PhD students, Omar Abu Qasim, who's currently now just accepted an offer as a professor in Canada. Uh, 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 we published a few papers on that domain, one of them uh, in 2019 in computers and operation research. And I will just move to uh, 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 the next one, which is we published last year in transportation research part C, which was based on the next generation quick scheduling problem 
These are the cranes that can work at two ports simultaneously. So uh, very different from the uh, uh, traditional uh, cranes. So these are the one on the right-hand side. Basically, if you look, uh, uh, they, they work in two-dimensional space, or sorry, in three-dimensional space. So they work at two ports at the same time. So they can basically move horizontally and, and vertically. So this adds a lot of complexity to the problem. Uh, we, we, we already published one paper in Transportation Research Part C, and we have the second paper under, review, under third revision in EJOR, the European Journal of Operational Research. Uh, in the, in the uh, faster scheduling problem, we also published last year a paper in Transportation Research Part E, so I, I know I'm running out of time. The last application that I would like to talk about, I see Monica smiling when I, when I mention time. <laughs> so it's about the, the, the blood distribution. So blood is different from other products in two main aspects. Uh, the age differentiation. So the, 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 the age of the blood product or the blood donation has an important factor, especially when we talk about platelets. Platelets has a shelf life of only three to four days. But despite of that also, in addition to that, uh, 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 some doctors or some medical papers have uh, proved that the age of the platelets has an impact or a big impact on the uh, success of an operation which means a platelet of one day old, that one day old has more potential or more benefit of a platelet of two days old. So to consider age differentiation in addition to a blood substitution inside the optimization model, that will add a lot of complexity. So uh, in the last two years, we published a few papers on a blood distribution that consider uh, uh, blood substitution and uh, age differentiation. But this year also, we published a paper uh, in Transportation Research Part E that consider a blood distribution uh, under a disaster. So we developed the stochastic programming uh, 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 method for this problem. And so as, as the, all of these papers, or five of the six papers, are already published. But all of my uh, work in progress is in, still it's in, in the same domain. So thank you so much and sorry for taking extra time. It's okay, thank you so much, Ali. Um, okay, so let's then move on to Samir. Sure, as soon as uh, Ali stops sharing, I will be able to share my screen. All right. Okay. Um, So I'm actually going to start with a picture which um, has nothing to do with transportation because it gives a big uh, context to what uh, the work I've been doing over the past few years on protection of transportation networks against sea level rise. This is a map of uh, the San Francisco Bay under uh, with the, in yellow here, you have the uh, nine, the names of the nine counties. Um, I guess Eugene, you're familiar with this since you, you're probably still there. Uh, and it's under three different scenarios of sea level rise, half a meter expected um, sometime before around the middle of the century, one meter uh, by the end of the century and 1.5 meter, if things get really worse, we could reach that actually at the end of the century. All these, uh, the dates I'm giving are optimistic, in fact, it turns out. So uh, imagine, uh, so what you have inside between the counties, this is water, this is the San Francisco Bay. And between San Francisco County and Marin County, there's a small inlet of water called, known as the Golden Gate, and um, this is the inlet through which uh, forcing, tidal forcing happened. So what, this is the Pacific Ocean, of course. Uh, if you can follow, it's on. can you see actually my, uh, my arrow? Can you see my pointer? Yeah, we can see it. 
All right, so here's this, uh, the Pacific Ocean. And as sea levels rise there, and this in addition to the effect of the tides leads to water essentially entering and potentially uh, in uh, leading to some inundation of parts of these counties. So at half, of what we're showing here now with these arrows is the effect of protecting one county on other counties. So what you see here, for example, is if you protect Alameda County, it has an effect. Uh, what you have here is the depth of, of the, the, not the depth, the length of the inundation. So it tells you how many meters inland will be inundated. So if you protect Alameda County, you're going to lead to something like 150 meters inland in Santa Clara County being inundated right and uh, you can follow the other colors accordingly at one meters uh, at one meter you start seeing more of these and then at 1.5 meter it's complete it's a complete mess so this gives a context because what we're interested in in this research generally is what is under limited budget because nobody has an infinite budget under limited budget which counties and later I'll move on to a level that is smaller than counties, um, but which counties should have priority. So this is the first part of our research. This is where we're working at the county level, all right? This is work I've done with my PhD student, Ilya Papa Constantino, who's now a postdoc working with me, and Jin Wu Lee, who was a postdoc working with me and now is assistant professor at uh, Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST. So the problem is, is quite interesting because it integrates hydrodynamics. So it's something that is a domain that people include mechanics, the PhD include mechanics typically work on, uh, and transportation. There's actually a third level I'm not talking about here and it has to do with governance. Uh, one of our collaborators, this is uh, all funded by an NSF grant, um, CRISP, um, the CRISP program, uh, which essentially where we had three, um, three core PIs, uh, myself, transportation, somebody who's a fluid mechanics uh, colleague at UC Berkeley, uh, and somebody who has, uh, who's in political science. So, um, we start with inundation. So inundation leads to link closures, links on the freeway. This leads to traffic rerouting. And as you're basically limiting the capacity in most cases, that leads to an increase in vehicle hours of travel, right? So each of these corresponds to some um, uh, simulation or some uh, other operator. So to predict inundation, we use um, a, a model called Cosmos, which was developed by US uh, Geologic, USGS, the US uh, Geophysical Survey or Geological Survey. And um, that gives us inundations. When we apply different protection scenarios, then we can see that where the inundation happens, right, this is still the uh, Cosmos. Uh, I'm not going to give you detail except that we've taken Cosmos and uh, we've refined it tremendously. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll say a few words about this later. So now we can predict which links are closed. So we need to take into account here the elevation of different links. So bridges versus uh, freeway links etc. Uh, so we use a digital elevation model here. Uh, we need to worry about traffic rerouting. So I, in this particular uh, work, we simply used user equilibrium. Uh, we went to more detailed things in um, simulators later, and then we can compute the increased vehicle hours travel. So which counties to prioritize with limited budget was the question. There are in fact nine counties, but San Francisco is always protected. San Francisco County, which by the way, is the small tip of the San Francisco Peninsula. That's always, in, uh, always protected. So it leaves us eight counties, which is 256 combinations. That's a small number. So we can just enumerate. We can basically run the simulations on each of them. 
And what was interesting in this research is we said, well, let's look at three different decision-making scenario. One, which is probably the most realistic is when you have a centralized decision maker coming in and making decisions. So this is if there's like a, a regional government of the Bay Area, which by the way, we don't have. But if we did, what would be the maximum, what would be the protection plan for a given budget that gives us a maximum benefit? Where benefit is defined as uh, a reduction in vehicle hours travel relative to no protection. The second scenario, which is um, kind of how things are now, is each county is acting independently to maximize its own benefits. Um, it's, uh, you can see that this is equivalent to a Nash equilibrium in game theory. And then we looked at uh, a third scenario, which um, we were trying to nudge actually the county decision makers uh, to adopt it, is one of cooperation. So you have coalitions that might um, form as a result of that, where their um, resources, uh, each of them has a certain budget possible to allocate to protection, where within a coalition, you pool your resources and you might use your resources to protect another county which turns out to be better for reducing vehicle hours travel in your county. Something that is not immediately obvious and was not necessarily expected. But the interesting results, in fact, showed, and excuse my voice, like Maggie, I'm battling COVID currently. <coughs> excuse me. So uh, in most cases, cooperation produces larger system-wide benefits, not just to the coalition, but to the level of the entire Bay Area than a Nash equilibrium. Now, of course, the centralized decision maker produces the highest system-wide benefit by definition, um, but it does not address issues of equity, which we'll come back in a few minutes. Um, all right. Um, now, the, then we, we, we obtain actually why we were doing this research. Um, the, um, San Francisco Bay Area, two uh, of the uh, government bodies um, that are Bay, Bay Area wide, came up with the concept of OLUs, Operational Landscape Units. What is this? Well, this is kind of a division of the Bay Area shore into segments that are homogeneous. And because they're homogeneous, you can now say, instead of looking at counties, you would be looking at things that are more refined and from a physical point of view, and in particular, hydrophysical point of view, are um, more realistic. This is work I did with a former PhD student, Jayun, who's uh, uh, until yesterday was a postdoc in my lab. Um, Aaron Chow, who I think is on the call, uh, who is a fluid mechanics expert uh, who we recruited from Berkeley. He had done a PhD there and uh, he's a research scientist in my group. And Alain Chukamsiwe, who's a computer scientist. So um, here we're talking about 30 OLUs, which essentially in terms of combination, there's all more than 1 billion possible combinations. So there's no, uh, no idea here of doing any kind of complete enumeration. I, as an aside, uh, with uh, working with SAFE and uh, one current PhD student, we're looking at kind of uh, clever um, combination of either uh, genetic algorithms or kind of machine learning methods to solve the problem with all 1 billion possible combinations. But that's not what I'm going to present. What I will talk about is how we kind of combined the results we had already obtained about county levels. Um, and we, where we have found that there are three counties that should receive top priority for protection, uh, Marin, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. And taking into account that we need to protect them, we'll just protect them and not worry so much about OLUs on the west side of the bay. These are all on the west side. We looked at um, 
at the morning commute, so we're only concerned with the East Bay to West Bay traffic. Uh, but because we have now, we were using now a more refined traffic simulation, uh, specifically MATSIM, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, it's a nature based uh, simulator. We included both automobile traffic and the BART system. BART is a regional rail network that uh, connects uh, can <clears throat> mostly the East Bay to the West Bay. And now the question becomes much simpler to just protect the East Bay away. It's which of them, there are five of them. So, and also uh, another alternative is how it, to protect an entire OLU with the seawall is to also raise the causeways of specific bridges. The causeway, if you can think of uh, bridges you might have seen, is a part of the bridge that typically is very close to the water. Uh, so if you, if you know the San Francisco Bay Area, for example, the Bay Bridge uh, starts in Oakland as a causeway and then becomes a cable stable uh, bridge. The, that causeway part is very close to the water. We looked at a one meter sea level rise here. So as I said, we improved the hydrodynamic grid. This is uh, Aaron's contribution. Um, the, we used MATSIM and a digital elevation model so that we could identify which specifically. Okay, so I'm just going to show you like a picture that tells you what we can do with this. So this is one particular, so um, we're, we're looking here at the reduction in traffic um, tra uh, in traffic travel time, I'm sorry, for each of the, of the different uh, TAZs, the uh, traffic analysis zones, as a result of some action. The action here consists of raising the causeways of the three bridges, or four bridges actually, um, versus taking no action. Anything that's green is an improvement. Everything that's red is uh, things become worse. So compared to no uh, to doing no action, there's a huge benefit, and especially so all the commuters in the East Bay, except for very few, which happen to be near the bridges that are now protected, so they experience more traffic congestion now because everybody's using that bridge. But other than that, everybody benefits. So that's one example. Um, we can do these things for a variety. So this is uh, another alternative, which is to protect this part, which is called the East Bay Crescent. That also has uh, significant benefits. Uh, and there are other, now of course, East Bay Crescent is one oil use, there are other oil use. I'm showing you this one because this turned out to be the best. Uh, final uh, uh, comment is, okay, I said optimality is great. We can solve for optimality, but optimality does not lead necessarily to equity. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, these areas, okay, that you, know, you see surrounded by uh, black uh, bold lines, these are so-called communities of concern. So these are um, primarily low-income communities or those with a high percentage of minority population. <coughs> and uh, we're concerned that what we find to be optimal may not be great from the point of view of equity. Here's, for example, an example of that. As I said earlier, three counties for optimality we would protect, uh, protect Marin, San Francisco is always protected, uh, San Mateo and Santa Clara. Well, when you do this, of course, these people benefit a lot, but the people in the, the commuters going from the East Bay to the West Bay suffer. And what is worse is a lot of those who end up suffering are the people living in communities of concern. You see that that red color. Uh, this is Alameda County, by the way, this, and you see that they will experience an increase of 40% in their travel time, uh, in their commute travel time, as a result of protecting the typically richer and more well-off uh, neighborhoods and communities in San Mateo and Santa Clara. Um, so this is obviously something of, of concern. Uh, to the planners in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so we, we did some simulation for them and we said that they could keep that optimal solution, but add to it a protection 
um, of uh, the East Bay Crescent. When you protect the East Bay Crescent, you allow uh, the, 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 the specific difference is that the Bay Bridge westbound is no longer inundated. And as a result, you improve things for the majority of people in the East Bay, including the majority of people living in communities of concern. Uh, um, so uh, I'll end up with, so this is a subset of the papers we've published related to this research. And as I assume, uh, if you want to, uh, we'll be sharing the presentations if you're interested in any of them, you can, um, you'll find them um, in that last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we are going to move on next to uh, NYU Shanghai. Zibin, if you could uh, share your screen. Great. Yep. Uh, so thank you for the nice presentation. And because NYU Shanghai, uh, this is the only presentation in this session. So I assume that I have 15 minutes. Okay. So I prepared a slide for this. So Take if your time. We're, we're, I can... we're a bit behind schedule, but uh, if so, anywhere you're okay. able to speed up, go ahead. But if not, take your time. Okay, thank you. So, um, I would like to share the actually just one study, okay, recent study, empirical analysis of electric vehicles uh, charging patterns, case study from Shanghai. So, understanding electric vehicle users' charging patterns can facilitate better decision making for related infrastructure and policy design such as charging station deployment or electric vehicle per, pursued uh, subsidy policy design, something like that. So however, um, the sample study in many researchers is related small, which may yield some bias finding. And secondary, the state of charge of the battery is generally not available. As such, for those studies, um, the analysis of the, of the charging behavior is either ignored or or conducted based on some inaccurate uh, model. Uh, thirdly, uh, comparison of behaviors between uh, battery electric vehicles and plug in the hybrid electric vehicles is seldom conducted. And so lastly, the um, high frequency and low frequency vehicle users are not differentiated. Though we notice that uh, the charging behaviors uh, among different types of vehicles and different types of users could be quite different. So um, Shanghai Electric Vehicle Public Data Connecting Monitoring and Research Center or Shanghai EV Data Center for short. Actually, as I mentioned, it's a private NGO, okay, uh, under the direction of Shanghai uh, Information uh, Economy and Information Technology Commission. So um, it collects data of all passenger and commercial electric vehicles sold and registered in Shanghai since uh, 2015. And up to today, it, it, um, it already collected more than uh, 0 0.6 million electric vehicles from more than 100 enterprises. So um, it has uh, the data set consists of 44 items of static vehicle information, such as the VIN number. Um, vehicle model, the battery size for each uh, electric vehicles and some uh, energy storage device and drive motor, something like that. And also uh, more importantly, the, it consists of, uh, it includes uh, 60, uh, 80 items the, of real-time vehicle information at a frequency of every 10 to 30 seconds, okay? These data includes, the, for example, the, the charging status, uh, uh, vehicle speed uh, accumulated mileage SOC of the battery and, and also vehicle location data, engine data, and so on. So um, actually the, the center support us with uh, uh, sample data. It, uh, with the sample data as adopted in our research, um, which was collected from about 6,000 PHEVs and 4,000 BEVs uh, over 11 months from May 20th to March 21st. So uh, the data set includes the state of the electric vehicles, the location and the accumulated mileage, the SOC of the battery, and also the battery capacity for each uh, electric vehicles. 
So given that uh, we first plot the daily the vehicle kilometer travel distribution for both BEV and PHEV, and we specify there are two peaks. Actually, it implies the two types of users. Okay, so then we apply some um, a mixture clustering model to cluster uh, the, the drivers into two types. So first type we call it as group S with small mean uh, and standard deviation of DVKT, which may reflect the vehicles only for daily commute. Why the other group, group S with a higher mean and, and standard deviation of DVKT, so actually in, it may refer to the uh, commercial vehicles, uh, such as the resourcing vehicles and taxes. So given that uh, we conduct uh, the analysis from four different perspectives. So first is the basic characteristic of charging activities. So first, uh, this is the table to plot, to show the um, different uh, charging factors, the mean value of them. So first, if we pay attention to the SOC before charging, uh, for all the for different types of DEV and with different uh, battery size, we'll figure out that actually the range is pretty high from 38 percentage to 61 percentage, which may suggest that uh, the electric the BEV users in Shanghai actually they have quite conservative uh, charging habits. And if we pay attention to the daily charging frequency of the PHA PHEV with bat with different battery sizes, we'll figure out that a larger battery size can encourage PHEV drivers to charge the battery more frequently and thus use more electricity. And if we uh, focus on the, uh, this part, these two, um, two co columns, so we can notice that uh, the recharge electricity, uh, the first one is the, ele the recharge electricity and the charging duration per charge event, we can see compared with the SBEV, LBEV actually they recharge more electricity per charge. However, their charging duration is much shorter uh, than the, than the B, uh, SBEV users, which means there is a significant difference between the charging powers adopted by these two types of users. So we plot a, a charging power distribution and we, without doubt, we, we, without any surprise, we can see two peaks. So actually, uh, when we cluster them into two groups, we can figure out that the first peak represents the slow charging, while the second peak re represents the fast charging. And this is the table for the clustering result. We can figure out that slow charging is more attractive for low frequency to BEV users, while fast charging is dominant for high frequency users. It's particularly true, I mean, for the SBEV and, and LBV with a small, battery capacity, they will prefer to adopt a slow charging. And then uh, we further investigate the initial or the state of char charge before usage or before driving. So if we pay attention for the uh, uh, SBEV and also the LBV, we will figure out that actually the, though their battery size could be quite different, but the SOC before driving is quite similar. Okay, which may suggest that BEV drivers might care more about the SOC, but not their remaining driving range before a trip. And then we turn to the spatial temporal patterns of charging activities. So first we plot the uh, um, daily charging patterns for each type of users. Okay, and we figure out that evening is always a peak hours for whatever types of users. And we also figure out that uh, for the commercial vehicles, uh, both the BEV commercial vehicles, commercial drivers, and also PHEV commercial drivers, actually, they also prefer to charge their vehicles uh, at noon or in the afternoon uh, when the passenger demand becomes low. And then uh, based on that, we actually can calculate that to fully electrify all gasoline private vehicles in Shanghai may entail an expansion of 20 to 30 percentage of the existing grid uh, capacity. And furthermore, if all right hailing vehicles are converted into BEV, an additional of 30 to 50 percentage of the current grid power is, uh, ne is necessary. And then we turn to the spatial distribution of the LBEV and of different types of users, we can see that LBEV users, um, they actually charge uh, intensively the, uh, within um, the CBDs. 
okay, the orange lines mark the city's area the, or the downtown area the, in Shanghai. Why the other groups, why the other uh, users actually they um they are their charging events are distributed more evenly. So and such a distribution is quite similar to their home location. So we can suggest, uh, actually it echoes the finding that uh, most of the drivers, uh, they prefer to charge at home or nearby for those non-commercial uh, users. And then we turn to the battery electricity uh, consumption rate. So this is the ECR, uh, uh, the curve with respect to the speed and temperature. Uh, similar to the previous research, um, is a curve, is a convex curve with respect to speed and temperature. And given the data in Shanghai, we figure out that a related high speed and low temperature may result in a 40 percentage increase in the ECR. And then we turn to the seasonal pattern, okay, of both type of both uh, B, SBV and LBV, we figure out that compared to May, the ECR in January increased by more than 36 percentage indicating more than one third reduction of the driving range. And regarding the, given that the operation modes of PHEV is quite different with the uh, BEV, because those drivers may first adopt the uh, charge depleting or CD mode and uh, to consume the electricity the first. And when the SOC of the battery reduced to a certain level, it will switch to a charge sustaining or CS mode to consume the gasoline. So, and these are four figures to show the um, four different uh, PHEV users, the over 11 months. This is the SOC uh, change. So as we can see, uh, some chips may mainly the, adopt the CDMO, while some other chips actually, they only the, uh, consume some the gasoline by adopting the CS mode. So as we can see, uh, different users, they might have totally different operation um, modes. So we develop a, a normal method to measure the utility factor uh, for those PHEV users. So the utility factor is, is an indicator to measure the proportion of the travel distance supported by the CD mode. Okay, as we can see from this figure, a larger battery size use a larger UF uh, factor. And compared with the SPHEV, the UF of LPHEV is significantly lower under whatever battery capacity. And thirdly, the, uh, the current standards such as the SAE may significantly overestimate the UF. So this is the la last part is about the range anxiety of the drivers. So uh, to figure out um, the range anxiety of the drivers, uh, actually we calculate the DVKT or, and the um, travel distance between two consecutive uh, charging events. So we call it DBTCE. As we can see uh, for the SBEV users, actually the second, um, the later one is much uh, larger than the DVKT or the daily the vehicle uh, travel, the daily vehicle kilometer uh, travel. And so it may, uncover that there is basically no range anxiety for SBEV drivers daily trips. However, it is not the same for LS for LBV, and and we can see that LBV's drivers' behavior may still be restricted to the battery size, and and furthermore, we plot the distribution. Uh, actually, we would like to investigate what if we enlarge the battery size. Uh, what's the impact on the uh, DC uh, DB TCE, and also the DBKT? Okay, the daily travel distance. From the left-hand side figure, we figure out that increasing the, the battery size or the driving range can lengthen the DBTCE or equivalently the reduce the charging frequency. However, from the right-hand side figure, we figure out that may not, it may not necessarily increase the DBKT, particularly when the battery size is greater than 175 kilometers. Actually, if we increase in the battery size, it will not encourage the driver to travel more. Okay, so that's uh, the, the all for today's presentation, and this is some of the conclusion. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we will now transition over to uh, NYU New York. Um, so Joe, if you would like to take it away. Sure. Thanks. Uh, 
Open my slides. <clears throat> uh, and by the way, I posted a question to Zeevan, uh, uh, but we can follow up later on about that. Okay. Uh, sorry. Is the full screen being shown or is there a part of it being blocked? Uh, we can see your, your full slide. The whole thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. All right. So, yeah. Uh, so, I was uh, uh, invited to uh, give a quick five minute uh, summary of uh, some of the work that I've been doing with regards to uh, this uh, initiative to uh, develop uh, like a network of living labs uh, with virtual test beds, uh, primarily using uh, Matsim uh, simulator uh, platform. Uh, so, I, I want to start by uh, highlighting some of uh, the general research areas that I work on. Uh, many of you already know, but I figure it's good to start there. Uh, so my work primarily focuses on two uh, general areas, one on uh, developing algorithms and models for operators to, uh, to manage their fleets. Uh, so mobility operators, public transit, uh, shared mobility services. Uh, and the other part is looking at models to evaluate support mobility markets. So looking at market-based equal, uh, equilibrium studies or, or considering data sharing problems, uh, platform design, uh, and such. So, so these are some uh, select publications that kind of uh, give a good summary of, uh, of this kind of work. Uh, a couple of which are in collaboration with uh, colleagues at NYU. Uh, some of the research, uh, recent projects that uh, we've uh, done, uh, I, I also decided to kind of highlight here. Uh, so we we have a project with uh, Volkswagen to incorporate uh, transfer capabilities into their electric ride pooling fleet. Uh, we have a project with a couple of uh, public agencies, including New York City DOT, to look at off-hour deliveries for New York City uh, with the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Uh, to uh, do a revamp and review of their data acquisition and analytics programs. Um, we have a project for NSF to look at modular automated vehicles. It seems like that's uh, a, a, a topic that uh, is uh, uh, resonating with, uh, through the multiple campuses. Uh, then with, uh, with New York State DOT, we've uh, been helping them in their procurement of uh, a next generation program to replace their uh, demand management program, uh, statewide program uh, into a more modern mobility as a service type uh, platform. Uh, and we've been working with other companies like VIA to develop a portfolio management framework to look at uh, evaluating different transportation technology, technologies across different cities. Uh, <clears throat> so what do I mean by uh, that last part? Uh, so. Uh, as we know, uh, transportation technologies and policies, they, uh, there's a big market dependency. The, the performance of a, of a technology in one city can vary significantly with the same performance of that technology in a different city. Uh, and traditionally, transportation planning paradigm has kind of focused on the city-centric approach where the, the decision maker is the city uh, or the region, and uh, they develop models to kind of focus on how uh, the, their, system, their their region would uh, would benefit or uh, or worsen uh, to uh, based on the implementation of that technology or policy, uh, but now with uh, this uh, emerging transportation services uh, ec economy that we're seeing, uh, there's a, a more of a shift, I, I believe, uh, to more of an operator centric planning approach, where you have mobility operators kind of. Uh, taking the initiative to engage with public agencies across different cities around around the country or around the world, right? uh, where uh, they, they they might be targeting cities based on the topology of the city uh, uh, to identify which city topologies would best uh, uh, best work for a certain type of technology, uh, and considering uh, you know uh, trying to identify consistent metrics that can then uh, they can use to evaluate these uh, new uh, research and development uh, outcomes uh, on travelers throughout the city. Uh, and so we related to those two last points, uh, that's kind of the uh, uh, motivation for us to uh, try to develop this network of living labs where we wanna have a consistent platform that we can use to measure uh, how, uh, let's say, uh, one of us develops a new um, a fleet operation algorithm and we want to test its impact in a variety of different types of cities 
uh, having an existing network of living labs can allow us to really uh, 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 accomplish that. Okay, uh, so uh, we've been developing uh, this platform for New York City. Uh, we called it uh, Matsum New York City, uh, for lack of a better name. Uh, uh, and and uh, I, you know, we know that uh, other campuses have also been uh, exploring this, uh, especially with Abu Dhabi and Summers group. Um, <clears throat> so here, uh, with uh, the maths in New York City, uh, the advantage uh, with maths is uh, there's uh, we're making use of a synthetic population uh, that, if well calibrated, can really provide very detailed uh, uh, ways of slicing the, uh, the impacts uh, of uh, uh, to to different segments of the population. Uh, it combines that with mesoscopic traffic simulation, day to day feedback loops uh, <clears throat> to account for uh, learning and behavioral uh, changes. Uh, and you can really use this for uh, unique use cases. Uh, so you can like, measure the sensitivity of holistic travel choices that uh, include uh, mode departure route uh, choices, uh, as well as uh, modifying impacts of congestion to uh, uh, different times of day. Right? Um, so this uh, Maxim New York City uh, Tool that we developed uh, was a multi-year yeah. effort. Uh, we started out with a one-year project to uh, develop the synthetic population and the, and the platform, uh, but we followed up with more applications and uh, technology transfer types of uh, initiatives. Uh, so developing uh, uh, application to look at bus network redesign uh, or looking at uh, currently one of the projects we're doing is uh, working with New York City DOT to take the data that they have for like uh, route restrictions or for trucks in New York City and incorporating that to develop a citywide uh, truck synthetic population uh, that we can then build into uh, uh, Matson. Uh, and uh, simultaneously in Seattle, uh, Jeff Band's group is also developing a multi uh, 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 multi level uh, model with us, uh, micro simulation using Sumo and that's a uh, macroscopic level. <clears throat> Uh, we've we've applied this to a number of different use cases, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've looked at uh, 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 applications like uh, city bike expansion throughout the city, or the hypothetical Amazon uh, headquarter uh, move to Long Island City, which no, didn't happen, but uh, when it was being planned, it was a, a, a big discussion. Uh, and we've looked at congestion pricing impact by time of day at, uh, and being able to measure the consumer surplus for different segments of the population. Uh, we've uh, considered the uh, Brooklyn uh, bus network redesign uh, and we're able to measure agent level mode substitution uh, and even forecast load profiles along the routes. Uh, we can, uh, uh, one of the uh, bigger projects we did was uh, uh, in a collaboration with uh, folks at Cornell uh, to look at COVID, uh, COVID impacts uh, on uh, shifts in mode choices, uh, the preferences for mode choices, uh, uh, shifts to work from home by different employment industries, uh, considering uh, ess essential workers, uh, and also transit capacity changes uh, due to uh, social distancing uh, regulations and how uh, the, uh, during the recovery we could uh, help uh, give uh, guidance on that. <clears throat> and these are some example research outcomes uh, uh, due to the uh, uh, development. Uh, and uh, uh, we've also been uh, inv invited to various talks and presentations, including uh, participating in the TRB workshop where we had over 800 attendees at the peak uh, back in uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's led to the development of a series of tutorials uh, in the student learning hub that uh, Molly mentioned earlier, um, and uh, that that's that's seen very uh, good attendance as well from people from different uh, universities and other uh, national labs, for example, at Oregon or uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as well. Uh, currently, we are, uh, as I mentioned, we're. Uh, uh, building out the truck synthetic population uh, to try to incorporate uh, tour based itineraries and associate that with uh, industry input output data in ways that are consistent with uh, freight analysis framework from the federal highway administration uh, route restrictions and uh, also allowing for different vehicle types so that later on we can look at uh, different types of modes for deliveries uh, in the urban area uh, like your cargo bikes or ferries uh, which is something that city DOT is interested in um, uh, in, a, in another parallel effort, uh, we've been working with um, Sarah Kaufman at the Rudin Center uh, to look at uh, governance uh, guidelines 
for mobility operators to work with city agencies. And one of the uh, challenges there was to try to identify uh, the, uh, the, the common set of zone designs to use to share data. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the underlying assumption is uh, if, you, if you have uh, data at, uh, let's say, a census tract level, uh, which is very disaggregate, right, uh, and you're able to share data at that level, uh, the mobility operators might feel uh, that that might be uh, uh, infringing upon uh, their uh, privacy of their customers or their, op their own operations. And at the same time, uh, the data that we collect at the public level from uh, travel surveys, for example, might uh, under uh, count, under sample, uh, uh, particularly underserved uh, population segments. So like uh, folks that are older age or uh, people that have disabilities or essential workers, uh, the sampling rates at the census tract level might be uh, might be under sample for those folks. Uh, and so we are looking at a way to design uh, aggregations of these zones so that uh, the data that we uh, can use at those zonal levels uh, would still be uh, sufficiently reliable. Um, and we're planning to make use of this higher uh, aggregation zone level uh, for um, generating the new synthetic population uh, in our next iteration. Uh, <clears throat> as an example, census tract level for New York City, there's about 2,000 tracks uh, or, 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 or so, um, and we're looking at a level of about 500 zones right now uh, that aggregates those to that level. <clears throat> um, and uh, another uh, effort that we're doing right now, uh, this is a project that is, that's just starting up this year, uh, and it's in collaboration, again, with Jeff Bann's group at uh, University of Washington, uh, is uh, trying to develop a uh, an interface tool uh, that can generically connect uh, Matsim uh, or other types of uh, agent-based uh, macroscopic uh, simulators, uh, which there are a couple, uh, for example, uh, Polaris at Argonne or uh, Beam model at uh, Berkeley, National, uh, Berkeley Lab. Um, and we're trying to create this interface tool that, uh, that will allow us to uh, uh, connect these types of agent simulations with local simulators. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, for example, Matsum uh, does day-to-day -day evolution uh, quite well, uh, but uh, it might be lacking in uh, simulation uh, tools for new uh, new emerging uh, technologies, right? So like uh, if, we're, if we're interested in a, a specific type of e-scooter operation, uh, Matsum might not have that, uh, even among the extensions that they have. Right, so can we create uh, a way to just connect it so that we can leverage Matson for the day-to-day -day evolution and, and then have, make use of the existing simulator for the wicked day simulation. Uh, and, and if we can do that, then uh, it can really broaden the applicability of these uh, multi-agent simulators. Uh, and that concludes uh, my talk. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, so if you look at the clock, you know we're at the actually the end of our program and we haven't even gotten to the discussion yet. So, uh, but that's okay. That means we had some good presentations. Um, if if colleagues in Abu Dhabi that, you know, it's the end of the day in Shanghai, I know it's approaching bedtime. If you're able to stay longer, we'd love to still hold the discussion. Um, we're here, obviously, um, holding down the fort. And in the interest of time, Khan has offered to actually skip uh, his presentation that he was going to make on the BQE Urban Test Pit since he already mentioned it earlier today. So uh, we have one presentation left and then we hope to have a discussion. So I will turn it over now to Professor Semiha Ergan. Um, you should be seeing my screen. Yep. All right, let me start. And I'll keep it very brief as well. Hopefully you're seeing the, the presentation view, not the notes. All okay. right, so I'll do my best to wrap this up very quickly. Uh, so this is an ongoing project with seat funding from C2 Smart. We are looking at a, a, a project where we're looking at increasing situational awareness for workers uh, who are working on work zones. But this particular project is, I'll skip those, you know that every 14 minutes there is an incident that's happening in uh, construction work zones. Uh, but the bottleneck is, um, Several of the measures that we are seeing for increasing uh, worker situational awareness, like um, delineated work zones, signages, um, even screaming cones, they are all for um, long term or inter intermediate uh, work zones that are uh, up to three days or more than three days. But when we look into short term and mobile work, uh, a couple of examples that you see here. Uh, within an hour uh, or moving continuously, 
these are the ones that where we have workers um, exposed to higher risks. So there are wearable uh, sensors that people can see, hear a sound on a headset or a, a, a vibrating alarm uh, on their uh, wrists. But the problem is the bottleneck is actually alarm fatigue that uh, when these are repeatedly activated, um, they will, uh, especially if they are redundant and un unnecessary, they will create that alarm fatigue that people will start ignoring those alarms. And it's, it's a very apparent problem that we see in um, op by facility operators when they look into these alarms that they receive on their screens 24 seven. Very relevant in the work zone safety uh, project as well. Um, so the idea with this project is, can we detect and eliminate those unnecessary alarms? Can we figure out what a worker is aware of uh, before sending those alarms? And can we calibrate those notification systems where we know that if a worker is already aware of the hazard uh, by looking, maybe changing their bodily position, additional data that we can leverage to see if that alarm is necessary or not. And then also figuring out the sweet spot of what type of a configuration people are more attentive to? Is it the sound? Is it the vibration? Is it the combination of these? How frequently these should be sent and, and in what duration? So this project that we have um, uh, right now going on is a, is a multi-year project that uh, we created an integrated platform composed of several sensing technologies. The idea here is testing these in a, in a lab setting where we can expose the workers in virtual environments to high risks that might not be possible in real test beds. Um, so the, the potential workers are seeing virtual models that we developed in real uh, work zones. BQEs was one of those test beds that we leveraged when they were installing sensors for by the research team. Um, so we developed these short-term work, work zones um, we created as is 3D models uh, where we captured those by laser scanners. They are wearing biometric sensors. We have ultrasonic sensors that are um, in the lab that shows the boundaries. Uh, these are used for um, trigger events, whether a person is out of the boundary uh, of the work zone, whether there's a speeding car or a collusion alarm. Uh, and we also have uh, micro simulation uh, tools that we use, SUMO is one of them, uh, to enable any reaction or anything that a user does uh, in the worker uh, uh, virtual environment is affecting the traffic flow patterns as well. So how did we leverage the setup was we looked into detecting those redundant alarms and calibrate the notification systems. So beyond just uh, whether a person is acknowledging an alarm or not, we looked into several other metrics that we developed in this project. Um, whether a person is changing their body the position and movement with respect to the traffic flow, whether they're uh, looking into their um, changing their gaze direction with respect to the traffic, are they looking, turning their head towards, which is an acknowledgement of they see the, the incident coming in. Um, were they, did they see the, the um, um, vehicle that was triggering the alarm, either it's a speeding alarm or a collusion alarm? Um, was it in the field of view of the worker? And we also captured um, uh, using a biometric sensor, their heart, heart rate change to see if uh, any variation is observed when the alarm was triggered to see they are also an indication of whether they um, saw the alarm, um, vehicle or not. So we looked into the, the captured data. Uh, this was an IRB uh, approved project uh, due, due to COVID. We couldn't collect the data, but now uh, for, the, for the last year, we have been doing this. And we have been looking into the data with respect to whether a worker is changing their position and gaze direction. So we have several of these plots that we generated looking into over the elapsed time of the experiment, how many times a person see a car, whether their gaze direction angle changed in the way in the expected direction. And the idea moving forward with this is right now we are building a reinforcement learning model where we're looking into good events necessitate an alarm being generated, even if the worker does not acknowledge it on the smartwatch, because through the smartwatch they receive those alarms. And with what modality of that alarm uh, the, the users um, 
uh, should receive those alarms. So we have several actions that we define. We have looked, defined the observation state and define the environment uh, for the reinforcement learning agent to learn, like um, workers' visual attention to vehicles, their gaze direction, uh, the distance that they uh, keep from the uh, approaching vehicle and things like that. And uh, we have formulated a reward function for the reinforcement learning model where several of, it's like a cascading decision tree where a, a worker's behavior beyond acknowledgement of the alarm is, is taken into account for uh, rewarding the, the worker uh, towards um, the safety notification. So this is um, ongoing, hopefully we, by the next time uh, we have a, a group gathering like this, I'll be able to share how the agent performs and, and findings related to their learning rates and things like that. 